Good afternoon and a big welcome to all attendees this afternoon to this, the second reliability maintenance webinar for Southern Africa. The subject of this webinar is fleet management, condition monitoring and reliability maintenance for power transformers. My name is Chris Yelland, the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I will be your host and moderator at this webinar signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to all our presenters this afternoon, all of whom will be introduced to you in due course. And of course, a big welcome to you, the attendees today, for your interest and participation. In South Africa, catastrophic transformer failures are increasing, causing interruption in power supply, high repair and replacement costs, revenue losses, and environmental and collateral damage from explosions and fire. A holistic strategy is needed for effective management of the transformer fleet in order to maximize its efficiency, reliability, and operating life. This, of course, may include online condition monitoring, routine diagnostics, condition-based maintenance, testing, reconditioning and refurbishment and replacement of power transformers in a systematic way. At this webinar, expert presenters, users and original equipment manufacturers and solution providers will be giving valuable insights on how to manage the transformer fleet for maximum reliability and life whilst minimizing the total life cycle costs. This is the second in a series of five webinars on reliability maintenance in electrical power systems. The first reliability maintenance webinar in December 2021 covered maintenance of boilers in power generation plant. Further reliability maintenance webinars, uh, which cover reliability maintenance in transmission and distribution networks, substations, switchgear and associated equipment will be taking place uh, in later this year. Today, about 800 delegates have registered to attend this webinar to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This, I believe, attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered, as well as the stature of the presenters that we have lined up. May I express a big thanks to all the presenters and the panelists, uh, they are going to be on the panel, for their participation and the time and effort that they have put in. I'm also truly grateful for the support of Agora Energy Vendor in Germany, ESCOM, of course, in South Africa, EPRI, United States, Camlin Energy, uh, based in Ireland and Italy, Doble, uh, based in uh, the USA, as well as in South Africa, and Electrix, based in South Africa, for the work that these companies do uh, to support South Africa's need for increased reliability and resilience of its power system. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download all presentations will be made available shortly to all those who have registered to attend. So while the Q&A, uh, while the presentations are in progress, please do send us your questions uh, as, uh, on the Q&A text facility. Uh, please, if I could ask you not to use the chat facility, rather the Q&A text facility uh, for your questions. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally, and I will take those that I am able to. We've set aside about half an hour after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. But now, without further ado, may I introduce our first presenter, Sid Sidwell Ntetwe. Uh, from ESCOM as follows. Siddle uh, is a professionally registered electrical engineer with a field experience of 20 years. 18 of these years have been in transformers and reactors spanning across the entire life cycle of this equipment. Hence a corporate specialist, he is a corporate specialist for power transformers in ESCOM. He holds an, a Master of Science in Power Engineering from the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa He's been involved in various transformer related activities and topics and served on international committees and working groups uh, like in the Seagray and uh, IEC. He's the past chairman of the Southern Africa Seagray A2 National Committee 
and a current EXCO member of, the, of Seagray Southern Africa as technical coordinator of Seagray Southern Africa. He's authored papers for various engineering platforms like Southpac, Seagray, Distributech and Doble, mainly on transformer related topics. He runs the transformer design course within Eskin, and I think it's absolutely uh, uh, it's a great honor to have Sidwell here today to introduce and set the scene uh, for this webinar. Uh, uh, over to you, Sidwell. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, and uh, 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 good day, everyone. Also to my co-panelists, it is also my privilege, uh, really, to be in this platform today to share some of, of my knowledge and uh, the things that are happening, especially around uh, the, the, the transformer field. As you see, even ladies and gentlemen on your screen here, that my topic uh, that I'm gonna be covering uh, is the challenges facing the South African uh, power pool. And it, it is such a great thing to have this seminar on power transformer fleet management, condition monitoring and reliability, which is a very interesting topic uh, also around this commodity of transformer. So as we'll be carrying on then my presentation, I'm trying to get my screen moving here. Yes, I'm winning now. We're gonna just uh, take a look at the outlook of the South African power pool, Southern Africa power pool. And then we look at also power generation capacity within South Africa and look at the power delivery network also of South Africa and challenges that are experienced in the same uh, space and then what can be done to sustain this power system, especially looking from the power transformer point of view so that we can continue well. Then uh, going further, if you were to, uh, to look at the South African power pool, uh, these are the countries that are in there. You will find that uh, every time, I, I think we are all aware that every time we speak of the Southern, Southern Africa power pool, the most thing that is mentioned is that our uh, electricity is not reaching the population as it is desired. So most of the rural areas in the Southern African power, Southern Africa power pool, they are still without electricity. However, the problem is not only there, even if you come back and you look on how these power systems are looking, you, you will realize that the challenge is still great. And as engineers also in Africa, we still have a long way to go even as a community in, 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 in the Southern Africa, we have a long way to go so, so that electricity uh, is available or uh, reaches uh, the population of ours in a way that we desire. So if you look at my slides here, uh, uh, just paying attention to, to these countries, you will see that there are numbers that are given there. The numbers that are in a, a blue box with white text is what is the installed capacity in, in each and every country. And then the green bar is for what is available. In other words, that is ready for service that it can deliver as of today. And then the brownish box is to cover the maximum demand that is reached. So if we have these numbers, which are extracted and, uh, from the Southern Africa Power Pool report of 2019-20, I know there, there, there have been some progress made since then. However, the picture is not changing too much, although it might be better but uh, we can still have a fruitful discussion uh, looking at these numbers. So we can see that there are three groups here. The first group is where the red dots are flashing at this stage. So this group is a group of countries that are not fixable as far as electricity is concerned. In other words, their installed capacity is, is way below their maximum demand. So even if they can have whatsoever that they've installed in the network, the network that they've built, is fully in service still they will not meet the the the, 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 the their maximum demand so that is namibia if you can uh, look there they've installed 610 megawatts yet what is serviceable is only 390 megawatts which is available and their peak demand is 700 megawatts so if that peak demand comes it's still way above the 610 that is installed lesotho is experiencing the same thing as well, by that time, they, 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 they have built infrastructure, infrastructure that can deliver 74 megawatts, but their maximum demand is standing at 150. So that even themselves, if they can put all in service, they still not meet their maximum demand. The same can be uh, seen on Swaziland or Eswatini, as it is known now. Uh, you will see that their peak demand is, is quite higher than the installed base. So that's the first group. 
And then the second group is a group that can improve uh, where the yellow dots are, are flashing at this stage, which is DRC, uh, Zimbabwe, and Botswana. If you look at them, their maximum demand is, is below their installed capacity. However, due to some problem that can befall anyone or that can happen anywhere, you will realize that what is available for service at this stage is, 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 is below uh, the maximum demands. But if they can put some of their plan, return their plans into service or solve whatsoever problem, they can, they can win this battle. And then there is also a third group, uh, which uh, unfortunately even our country is part of, and, and that is mainly South Africa and Malawi. If you look at, the, at these two countries, um, their installed uh, capacity is it's, 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 it's quite adequate and it is way above uh, the, what's the, thing, the maximum demand. Even what is available at this stage is above their maximum demand. However, they are on a narrow margin that if they lose few of their plants, the system may, may go to load shedding as we experience in our country. You can see that with the installed, uh, sorry, with the available capacity of 43 gigawatts, uh, 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 and the maximum our peak demand being 39 megawatts. If we lose few power stations, we are already below the 39, even as it is happening at this stage. So these are the main challenges. The others, or the rest of the countries that you can see here, they, they've got a good margin between a, a peak demand and, uh, and, uh, and, and what they have installed. However, that does not take away the, the, the fact that behind these numbers, even no matter how good the system is looking, but the electricity is still not reaching as uh, far as many people as it is desired. Now, moving further, if we can just zoom into South Africa now, and we look at the generating capacity as reported by you said in 2021, which is last year. Now, they said the installed capacity is about 58 gigawatts or 58,000 uh, megawatts, of which uh, 3.4 gig gigawatts is from hydro and 48 is from uh, thermal and there is also a, a picking up there as you can see in wind solar and and others also they they, they are really ramping up as uh, it can be also be learned from various platforms that you might have been in now something important to note is that 44 gigawatts of this uh, available generating capacity in south africa is from escom and uh, uh, while uh, out of that 44 gigawatts as well, ESCOM is generating 38 gigawatts using the coal-fired power station. Now, there are also other municipalities and IPP, IPPs that have come in uh, to play a role there in the generating space. Now, as you know, uh, that the load centers are far away from the generating station. So we need an infrastructure that is going to evacuate that power from the power stations uh, to where the load centers are. And power is transmitted then in South Africa using uh, to the load centers using uh, long transmission lines. And at this stage, they uh, estimated at about 30,000 kilometers of different lines uh, and at different voltages as well, mainly at uh, 400 and, uh, kV and 765 kV, but with 275 kV as well, uh, being there in uh, uh, provincial level. Power is then distributed to industrial uh, and domestic customers, where, which is our households and all the factories that we know. And also even municipalities, we can bring them here at voltages that are less than that of transmission lines. Mainly we, it's 132 and below, but some municipalities as well, they do operate at volt, uh, lines of uh, about 275 kV. However, what is important in, in all this is that generator step-ups, the coupling or network transformers and the distribution transformers has a key to role in the uh, to, to play in the in the power system as all this generated power cannot reach the the end users without transformers then transformers they really become that core equipment in the substation not that the others are not important but uh, this brings to say they, they are at the center of this power uh, evacuation and distribution now, if we look again um, in the challenges that are in the South, South African grid, as we mentioned, capacity is the main thing at, at this stage. Uh, as you can see, and as we know, as we experience, if you're in the country, even for the, since this week started, we have got those rotating load shedding 
at the loss of few power stations, as I've mentioned before, you will realize that we, 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 we have got rolling blackout. Then, and also if you can look here on this graph here, you will see that there, there are different lines of different uh, colors. The way the purple one, uh, like where I'm pointing now, it's, uh, it's 4765 and the greenish ones are for the 400 kV. And wherever these lines are interconnecting, there is a transformer of a particular size and, and time. Now, if these things happen and they are not uh, uh, coming well as desired, we roll into the blackouts as mentioned. Now, further challenges that uh, the, the, the system is facing is uh, one of them is vandalism, mainly on the transmission and distribution infrastructure. As you can see there on the left hand of, of the screen, this is a, a transmission tower and all the members of that tower uh, or most of the members on the tower have been stolen. It's looking like a funny shape now. And uh, as you can see in the, in the middle picture, uh, then uh, at a certain stage or under certain stress, it will collapse. It cannot stand uh, uh, without those members. And when these things happen again, they, 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 they reduce the capability or the capacity of the already compromised, uh, uh, what's this thing, uh, grid. So the problems of, of even power shortages cannot only be confined to the generating, uh, generating capacity or the available generators, but also even the transmitting infrastructure can be compromised, the distributing infrastructure can be compromised such that power can will not be able to reach the end users. Even if you look at the right bottom there, you will see that that is a clamp and this is not a mechanical failure because the structure has weakened or whatsoever, but it is attacked intentionally. As you can see, the cut is very smooth and clear and fresh to see that it's not something that was happening over a long time. It was just happening at the time. Even on the other one, you can see the oil on the ground where people will in vandalize transformers because they just want to take oil out of those transformers. So vandalism is a very serious uh, threat to the network. It's a very serious challenge at this stage. If you can look at the incidents that are related to vandalism of the uh, power network, uh, it's really high. Number two, which is it's, it's more, almost close, you know, where, close to each other. Where you see vandalism, it means also theft is there. You know, they vandalize to steal, you know. So even that the, the hardware, as you can see here, the cables, and the guess what? When all these faults happen, they go back to the transformers. The transformers will feel it somewhere in the network. As you can see on the left-hand side there, the cables have been cut, you know. These are the people breaking into substation and they're stealing these things. You can see also on this foot of the, of the tower in the middle picture that some bolts are already gone, some parts have been removed. This will lead to a collapsing of the, of the, of the, of the structure at the end of the day. Another challenge again is power theft itself. Now, not no longer the theft uh, on the um, on the on the hardware itself, or on the hardware alone, but also on 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 the power. You know, we speak of a, a illegal connections. If you go to the townships and uh, in in other places, you will find crazy crazy connections on the on the on the pole mounted transformers. And in some cases, these they explode and fail. You know. And then the community is without power. It looks like there is a failure of the utility or the failure of the municipality uh, to, 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 to deliver power. But actually, you will realize that even the, the community themselves, they're an enemy of theirs because uh, they, they are not coming together in protecting this infrastructure. They allow and they, 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 they cast a blind eye when these illegal connections are happening. But you know, the, no matter what you do, if the transformer is beyond what it is rated for, it you cannot withstand that. As you can see, even you know, on the right, on the picture on the right hand side, that that transformer has eventually caught fire because of these things. Because even these illegal connections, they are not professionally done. It's shocking if you see what people will do on those in, uh, uh, in on that infrastructure. Now there is a ripple effect of this, is, uh, and 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 it creates. A, a very uncomfortable situation and a very frustrating situation because for, for, for any organization, whether it be ESCOM, municipal whatsoever, but what it brings are the financial losses 
to repair this infrastructure and also to replace that infrastructure. And what does that mean? It means that it delays the, the further improvement in the power systems. So the, 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 the funds that are supposed to fund the new project expansion projects, they go back again and, and, and they bring back that which has been lost uh, through this unbecoming behavior. It also means unreliable network uh, because you, you find that the, 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 when things have been stolen, when things have been damaged, the network will not operate as it is required. The protections are, are not uh, uh, operating as needed, and it may lead to a, even an extreme damage that was not necessary uh, in, in, in the first place. It is also an unsafe network for the community, for the workers, and for the adjacent land it's, it, itself. So all these uh, problems, in as much as they, 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 they may look as way of life, uh, at this stage, given the poverty or the, 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 the social ills of the country. But the fact of the matter is that they are compromising the, the, the good state of the network and it is collapsing day by day, which may lead us to further uh, black, uh, rolling blackouts, even when the generation uh, or generating capacity has been sorted. Now, if we flip and uh, flip and then just take a look on the other side, they, there is also um, another issue which uh, I've already laid a foundation. If you look on the other side, that we also have the odd fleet. You know, if if you look on transformers specifically, uh, whether in, municip in municipalities or in ESCOM, there, there is that uh, percentage of the old fleet. And the, the question is, why do we have old fleet? It's because one, we do not uh, replace transformers just because of age. Yes, there is an expected uh, lifespan of a transformer, but they, there is not uh, abundant funds such that uh, with, a, with an asset just re reaching that age, you replace it. We do the same with our phones. We do the same with our cars. I mean, you will see if you've, you've got funds to do that, but while funds are not available or while uh, funds ask us, we may need to do something so that you keep the, as the, 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 the asset going. So, but the challenges that it brings when you, you run the, the, the old fleet is that it is vulnerable to true faults. Like I mentioned, uh, the vandalisms on the line and the thefts that are happening there, those they cause true faults on transformers. And that may lead to transformers failing because they are old. You find that their clamping uh, uh, is no longer as sound as when they were new and them having seen true faults over a period of time, they are, they are, they are not uh, able to withstand that. And moreover, the network impedance as well has, uh, which is the system or the source impedance has reduced compared to the time most of these transformers were done. So if they are false now, the, the, the magnitude of that fault is quite higher than the, the time when these were installed. It is also a risky thing to do the needed intrusive maintenance on these transformers. We have experience where you, you know that an old transformer has got an issue or is due for that maintenance. You train the oil so that you can attend to maintenance. And then all of a sudden you find that the insulation inside, it just collapses and that transformer can no longer go back into service. Not because you did maintenance wrong, but it was weak to undergo intrusive uh, maintenance. And also there is an issue of, of obsolete components, you know, some some uh, uh, manufacturers like for, for tape changer spares, they, they are no longer in service. Also, when we speak of L technology, we cannot leave out the, the issue of the pushings. Uh, in ESCOM, we, we have taken a, a lot of pain, especially at the distribution level because of the oil impregnated paper pushings, which they fail catastrophically and they cause uh, transformer uh, fires like the, the the one transformer that is, is shown on the right hand side was from one of our substations where in one day in fact within even 12 hours all three transformers on the substations were lost because of pushing failures it became a cascaded effect and also as i mentioned some temp change oems are no longer in business and we have to find re-engineered parts, but then they may not serve you as well as for the original space. And also we've got issue of the free breathing transformer, that's uh, transformers that we've run for quite a long time and that has caused oxidation in the So in all this, the combination of this says, the plant is, is old, the plant, you know, did not receive the best care uh, in the past, not because the engineers were ignorant, not, but it's because how the know-how was at that time, you know, we try and improve as, as, as time goes on, but the fact of the measure is that some of the life have been lost. 
Now, the main question is what can be done on transformer fleets uh, in different organizations or utilities to, to, to promote sustainability? Now, if you look at uh, ISO 55000, which was the past 55 standard in the past, they mention uh, uh, five things that are, are, are a risk um, uh, to effective asset management or to management of transformers, because that's where the focus is of today. Number one is when you do not know what you have. So whether you are an, a, a, a utility like ESCOM, you're a municipality or so ever, even an end user of transformer, the first thing is that you must know the transformers that, 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 that you have. So for you to, to have that effective asset management, it, it starts there by knowing what you have. Uh, number two, yeah, it's a matter of looking on maintenance. You must not do over maintenance because maintenance does uh, reduce, uh, sorry, does introduce uh, risks when it is done. We, we as a utility have experience as well where we took transformers for maintenance and they never returned from maintenance because the maintenance was not done correctly or the skills when doing maintenance were an issue. But over maintenance and, uh, and under maintenance, they both have a problem. Under maintenance, it cannot be emphasized. We know what's a, what's a, what's a, what are the effects if you do not uh, uh, maintain your assets in time. And improper operation as well. As we see also uh, asset abuse can be by the operator and it can be also by the imposed environment as we have covered uh, under the issues of theft, under the issues of vandalism, in as much as they are not intentional, but they can become an improper and they do become improper operation of the asset. If the asset is, 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 is abused, is not gonna, going to last as long as it is desired. Also improper risk uh, management. You know, sometimes you know the issues, you know the problems that you have, in your assets, but if you do not take the actions on time or the adequate action, still that, that becomes or remain a useless exercise. And lastly, it is the issue of sub-optimized asset management system to say your systems must be effective uh, to, to conclude all of the above so that it is done correctly. So what are the solutions? Uh, every organization must have the fleet list in terms of transformers, know what transformers that you, that you have and where are they? Number two, uh, it, there must be a credible maintenance philosophy that stipulates clearly what must be done on a transformer and when. Number three, also the operating philosophy, you must know the things that are not desired for the network where you need to take action if it has come to, to, to that level. And then also the issue of periodic asset appraisal because that's where now you follow up and you, 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 you monitor uh, the condition of your transformers and know what to do on which transformers rather than things taking you by surprise. And also at this stage, there are a lot of solutions being offered towards asset performance uh, management tool. So those are the things that will assist each and every organization to deal with these issues. Now, this is a typical uh, way of tracking what you have and knowing what you have uh, in, in your system. It is, this is a typical um, uh, uh, fleet list at the stage presented in, a, in an histogram and uh, in H brackets. So this organization has uh, eight transformers between one and five years. And you can see that also, and they um, are transformers that are between 50, uh, above 50 years that can so, which is above 37, which is an indication of what we're saying to say, transformers are not merely replaced just because of H, but if they are uh, well looked after, if uh, adequate things are done, you can see your asset even going uh, further. Not only knowing uh, uh, the numbers, but also knowing the condition of that fleet. It's something that is very important. As you can see here, when it's blue, it means it is very good. And when it's green, it's also good. Both uh, green and blue, uh, uh, they mean that you just need to do normal maintenance. There's, there's, there, there, there's nothing more than that. Your asset is as good as new or is still in a very good condition. You just carry on with normal maintenance. And then when it is yellow, it means it's in a fair condition. You might have a few problems here and there, but you know those problems. Maybe you have just have to increase diagnos uh, diagnostics on, 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 on the transformer and take corrective actions on time. However, when it falls to orange or red, it means now you, you, need, you need more. You need to pay attention to that plan to replace if it's an orange. If it's red, it means it's, a, it's an asset that really uh, requires that it be replaced, especially if it is in a critical 
pay or in, in, a, in, a, in a critical position in the network. Now, uh, uh, as we as we steer towards the the the, uh, the 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 end of this presentation, now when it comes to asset uh, health uh, uh, determination, various organizations use different approach. Yet there is a degree of commonality that has been observed uh, internationally. It, it, convergence is not there, but the, 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 there is a common base in it as we can see maybe if we, we look at the presentation by various organizations. SICRI, which is a, an organization for large electrical system, is still working towards uh, bringing convergence, convergence into this methodology to find out if we, we, we can do things in the same way. Uh, ESCOM has worked on the asset uh, health determination since 2006, especially for transformers. It is uh, something that has been well executed and well done over the years and the fruits are very evident even in the performance of the of the fleet and this has been fine-tuned as we go through uh, the years so with this uh, of uh, 16 years experience you can imagine that there must have been a lot of learnings that have been uh, achieved now also, it is important to know what matters on, on a transformer. In other words, what gives indication of loss of life or a risk of failure? Because it's not probably anything that we monitor or that we can monitor or that we can see that is meaningful. Some of the data can just become noise. So it's very critical that uh, in your approach, you know what is it that matters and that can, can, can tell you where you are going. And the challenges that we have experienced and that we have seen and that we are sorting was lack of credible database. Uh, in other words, information not being readily available and knowing what matters the most. And to say, you know, when you are doing the, uh, the, the asset appraisal, it's a, it's a complex exercise. So it needs to be approached with great care. Now, uh, the things that we use there are oil results, which is our age assessments and, chemi and chemical condition of the oil as well. We look at DGA for the main transformer and also for the tape changers, and then also electrical test uh, for transformers and pushing and, and, and tape changers. Although mainly electrical tests, we, we, we want to, to use them, uh, most of them, not all of them, as a further um, investigation uh, information rather than as a primary thing to determine uh, the asset health. But when it comes to pushing, we know we, we, we know the health of the pushing through the 10 delta and the capacitance. So the electrical test on the pushing will be the main thing. Also, we have input from the uh, visual inspection. So that's what we'll do to manage this. And without then further ado, that's the end of my, my presentation. And thank you very much. And back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Sidwell, for setting the scene uh, from the utility perspective, uh, looking at the uh, picture in uh, Southern Africa, the Sadek region, uh, through to the uh, South African uh, situation, uh, covering our experiences here uh, and, and the challenges uh, faced uh, by utilities in running uh, these uh, large fleets of transformers. You know, I, I'm told that Eskom has a fleet of something of 300,000 MVA of transformer capacity in its uh, system. That's just Eskom. I don't have an exact figure for municipalities, but I'm sure it's a similar kind of order of magnitude. Uh, so one's looking at a massive installed base in South Africa, and the management of this fleet uh, is an ongoing challenge, especially in light of financial uh, constraints, um, uh, resource constraints, uh, aging fleets, uh, as, as, as Sidwo has so well pointed out. But uh, we're not here to only dwell on the problems, although, as Sidwell said, we have to know where we are. We have to, you know, we, there's no, uh, we can't look at this problem through rose-tinted glasses. We have to know exactly where we are in order to start understanding uh, some of the solutions. But it's really important uh, that we do uh, look at solutions because uh, these are not insurmountable problems. Uh, and we've got a fantastic team lined up here today to talk about solutions. Uh, and to offer some guidance uh, both locally and internationally. So uh, first of all, it's uh, uh, thanks to Sidwell, and it's my great pleasure now to introduce to you uh, Dr. Marco Tozzi. Uh, Marco uh, received an MSc degree in electrical engineering from the University of Trieste 
in Italy in 2005 and a PhD degree in electrical engineering in 2010 from the University of Bologna. And from 2007 to 2011, he was project manager and technical advisor for TechKimp Italy, being involved in research activities on diagnostics of insulation systems by partial discharge analysis. In particular, his project work was mainly focused in developing partial discharge detectors for power transformers, for gas insulated switchgear and, in, and inverter fed motors. In 2011, he joined Camden Energy, where he was initially involved in developing partial discharge permanent monitoring systems for transformers and then leading the product management team. Uh, and since, 2000, uh, since January 2022, he's the senior advisor at uh, Camlin Energy. And he's a co-author and author of more than 40 technical and scientific papers in this field. So it's an absolute uh, pleasure and honor to, to have uh, uh, Marco, a global leader in the field of uh, transformer uh, monitoring, uh, to give us his insights as to some of the solutions uh, with respect also to case study. So over to you, uh, Marco. We can see your presentation uh, well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And that's definitely my pleasure to be here and with all the other uh, speakers today. A really good opportunity for us. So today we're going to talk about the benefits of online monitoring of partial discharges uh, uh, in uh, transformer bushings. And we will see this with uh, some uh, real case, of course. Um, just a few words about Camlin. So we have, uh, although the name might sound new, actually we have an history stretching back more than 30 years. And we have been actually the pioneers of the use of infrared technology for multi-gas analysis for transformer oil. And we have world-class facilities, in-house expertise, and we have offices across 17 countries with headquarters in Northern Ireland. We control the full development and deployment of our products from R&D, to product design, in-house manufacturing, quality, installation, and commissioning. The whole process is, of course, supported by uh, specialists in uh, monitoring, diagnostic technologies, and uh, analytics. Um, just to give you an idea, we have offices that are uh, fully dedicated to artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, applied to the world of the diagnostics of transformers, rotating machines, and circuit breakers. So today we will discuss why it is important to monitor bushings, then what parameters should be monitored, and how to interpret the, the data that comes from the monitor. All these will be explained, of course, using real case studies and success stories from the field. So let's start with why bushings, why bushings should be monitored. So there are two great documents which are the cigarette technical brochure 755 and 642. They are not brand new, but they are still valid and very, very good uh, about both bushings and transformer reliability. So it is clearly indicated that, for example, bushings can contribute to transformer failures with a percentage between five to 50%. If we look at the generator step ups, the percentage is actually 30%. So most important, actually, the, they are the most common uh, cause of fire and explosion. If we look at the statistics of South Africa, for example, uh, two very good papers have been published in 2007 reporting both statistics on transmission and distribution transformers and the bushing were responsible for uh, above 25 percent of failures so monitoring bushings it, it is critically important because together with windings and oltc they really contribute to let's say 80 percent of transformer failures and their individual contribute is very significant around 30 percent now, let's move on what parameters should be included in an online bushing monitoring system. Because typically, when talking about the bushing testing, the two popular parameters are capacitance and tan delta, also known as a power factor in North America. But there are several kinds of defects that can develop in a bushing. You can have aging of insulation, uh, different kind of contamination, moisture, external surface contamination, particle contamination. You might have you know, problems due to the aging of the oil, uh, dielectric problems, uh, tracking, partial discharges, connection problem, core overheating. I mean, you can see we're talking about 
many different causes and a variety of offline tests that can identify these causes. But you cannot do all these tests together every time. We are getting in, as it was said before, in over maintenance here, one of the five risks of uh, proper asset management. It is expensive and time consuming. So if you look at the standard capacitance and time delta test, typically it is done uh, after several hours or even days that the transformer is uh, shut down at just one voltage, one temperature, one frequency. This test sometimes works, but it could not be enough to track all the problems that might be in a bushing. So online monitoring have a specific role, which is not to replace the offline test. And uh, I'm pretty sure Alexander will talk about offline tests later. Uh, so um, they are very important, but you have to select the right offline test. So the goal of online monitoring is to detect anomalies online and then suggest uh, what could be the best offline test in order to um, um, protect your transformer, plane maintenance, and so on. Thanks to the online monitoring system, you can understand what is the failure mode. And this is the key to understand what is the best test to do. The best thing is to uh, explain all this with, with uh, an example. So this case was published in 2004 uh, by BC Hydro, uh, Canada. The bushing was taken out of service and inspected. You can see from the visual inspection that this bushing is definitely in faulty condition and cannot be taken in service. That's clear. But if you look at the table, the tan delta values are reported before and after the failure. And according to the electrical test, the bushing is perfect. Tan delta is a 0.3, exactly like the nameplate value, and the capacitance is very close to the nameplate value. But it is clear that this bushing cannot remain in service. If we look at the DGA data uh, after sampling the oil of the bushing, there are more than 9,000 ppm of hydrogen, more than 3,000 ppm of acetylene. It is clear that the problem is an arcing event, electrical discharges. So monitoring electrical discharges and partial discharges would have definitely helped in this situation to take this bushing out of service well before. So what do we have to monitor when we talk about bushing monitoring? There are mainly four parameters. Leakage current, from which we can estimate the relative variations of tan delta and capacitance, and then partial discharges, from which we can estimate the presence of arcing, but also presence of small discharges for cavities and particles. And then top oil temperature and load. Very useful for the correlation and the determination of the failure mode. By monitoring these parameters, it is then possible to detect and identify short circuits, contamination issues, problems in the C2 of the bushings, presence of arcing, and cavities in a resin. The principle of an online monitoring system is very, very, very simple. There is an impedance typically housed in a rugged adapter, an impedance connected in parallel to the C2 of the bushing. Okay. And from here, you can get both the low frequency, 50 or 60 Hertz, and the high frequency in the megahertz region for the partial discharges. Now, in case of, for example, a short circuit between two layers, the current, the leakage current of that specific bushing will increase more than the others. So there will be an increase of the relative uh, difference between the three currents. And this can be mathematically translated in a relative capacitance increase. If there is an increase in the losses of the bushing, then the angle will change between bushing A and B, A and C. It will change of an angle reasonably, uh, that we, the angle that we typically call delta from which we have the tan delta. And by monitoring the differences in the angle, you can basically mathematically estimate the relative variation of the tan delta. At the same time, you can detect the partial discharges from the same impedance. Of course, it has to be properly designed. You, have, you, you can detect the high frequency pulses. And then, for example, studying the polarity of the patterns, it is possible to see if the PD are in the bushings or in the main tank. Again, this is not achievable just taking a portable PD detector and putting inside a box. This is achievable only if the 
PD monitoring system is properly designed for this application. So these are the principles of the monitoring system. Let's see now what results they give and how to interpret the data with some success story. So the very first example is a case we had from South Korea. So we were monitoring a three, four, uh, five, three, 345 kilovolt oil impregnated paper bushing. And suddenly the monitoring system has detected a small increase of only 1.6% in one of the bushing, the bushing A. Now 1.6% is very small and uh, very, very few customers, very few utility, very few users would change a bushing just for 1.6%. Typically you start to take an action after 5%. But it is interesting to see that at the very same moment, the partial discharge module integrated with the bushing monitoring system has detected a single arcing event. It is just, we call it high energy event. It is a partial discharge that has very high amplitude. We're not talking about picocoulomb, we are now in the nanocoulomb region, okay? With only eight pulses in one second, nothing. Okay, so if you take this partial discharge that happened only once alone, or you take the capacitance increase alone, you will not do any action. But if you combine them, these two small events together gives you a great information. It cannot be a coincidence. It might be that there has been a short circuit between two layers and, and with a consequent, with a consequent um, arcing. So what we suggested here was not to do the offline test because it is also difficult to detect 1.6%, but to do a DGA analysis of the bushing. The DGA analysis was done and in only in that bushing, we found 76 ppm of acetylene. Now a bushing with 76 ppm of acetylene cannot stay in service. The decision was easier thanks to the combination of the data from the online monitoring system. But what is even more interesting is that two years after in the other part of the world, we saw exactly the same thing. On the same kind of bushing, 345 kilovolt, oil impregnated paper, we saw the capacitance change and the high energy event. We suggested immediately to do the uh, DGA analysis and uh, we found immediately 21 ppm of acetylene and suggested to replace the bushing. So this is a very, very important uh, case of how the correlation of parameters can constitute a sort of uh, failure mode pattern that you can recognize also in different situations and suggest what is the best technical uh, action. The second case is different because it is again partial discharges but correlated with the tan delta or power factor. So the red track is the tan delta of this bushing, bushing X3. And you can see that it was fairly stable. And then in four months, it has it had an increase of 0.6%, which is quite significant. But what is very interesting is the activity of the partial discharges in that bushing. So this is the trend of the PD recorded and separated only in that bushing. And before the, the tan delta increase, they were sporadic and then beca they became more persistent. Now, when you have a tan delta increase like that, uh, typically everyone think about a moisture ingress. But with moisture ingress, you don't have such a kind of partial discharge activities. In fact, if we look at the pattern, this pattern is typical, let's say, I know that when we talk about PD, we, are, we talk about a little bit of applied witchcraft. So when I say typical, it is not that easy to find out. But to an expert eye, this pattern is some particle in oil. So what is the suggestion here is to do, an, again, a DGA test in this case, but also an oil quality test. The DGA was done on this bushing, and 9,700 ppm of hydrogen were detected plus the breakdown voltage was quite low. The bushing was inspected and particles were found in the bushing. This was a defect in the manufacturing of the bushing. The bushing was only two years old, but a lot of particles were found inside the, the bushing, not inside the core, but outside, let's say the main core. Other bushings were then tested with DGA and had the same problem, bushings of the same batch and replaced. 
The third case is about a resin impregnated paper bushing. Very important because a resin impregnated paper bushings are stated to be PD free, which is okay, it is right, and they are safer, but they are PD free as long as they don't have PD. When they have partial discharges, the resin doesn't tolerate the PD. The partial discharge can uh, accelerate the degradation of the resin and create a breakdown quite easily. We have seen this in rotating machines many times. So these three uh, resin impregnated paper bushing, in two of them, we have seen suddenly, after uh, just two or three years of service, another capacitance increase, this time 12%, so quite consistent. Enough, enough to justify an action. But what it is very interesting is to see that there was a partial discharge activity right together with a capacitance increase. Completely differently from the oil case, in the resin, the PD was not just a single event, but was a continuous activity. Why? Because there was a cavity. In fact, the pattern is the typical pattern for cavity in resins. We have seen this in, everyone can see this kind of patterns when analyzing uh, partial discharges in rotating machines. So this is a void, a cavity that was created. And once the partial discharge uh, is incepted in this, in this cavity, it doesn't stop. But what is even more interesting here is that if we look at the history of this bushing back a couple of months, there was already this partial discharge activity, but was very small, a few months before the capacitance increase. So you can see this was like a couple of weeks before. This is the cavity at the initial stage. And then after the capacitance increase, the cavity to the final stage. What does it mean? Again, a correlation pattern. So if we see again in a resin impregnated paper bushing a small PD like that, it is enough to say, hey, there is a problem, there is a cavity. Resin impregnated paper bushings should not have cavities. We go now to the last case. Very interesting, this is in Asia. Again, it is a correlation between the tan delta and partial discharges. So the uh, red, uh, trend here is the top oil temperature. The black trend is the partial discharge activity in one specific bushing. And this is the tan delta, relative tan delta, monitored on the same bushing. And this is the PD pattern. So at a certain point, the top oil had a step increase. And a few hours later, the partial discharge activity started. You can see it here. It is a perfect uh, symmetrical partial discharge. Um, with the polarity for PD in bushings, the direct polarity. But what it is interesting to see is that the partial discharge and the tan delta goes up and down together. Every single pattern is uh, uh, summarized every hour. And this is the real, in real time what happened in the bushings, the 69 kilovolt bushing before it was taken uh, out of service. So we are typically used to see an increase of tan delta due to moisture, a linear increase, it is not the case when you have a partial discharge activity like this. Actually, it is the partial discharge activity in this case that is causing the losses of the bushing, and it is driving the tan delta to, to go up and down. It is not the opposite way around. So after the alarm uh, was given, the utility has switched off the transformer uh, the diagnosis was quite clear, so there was a problem of an increase of losses of the bushing, and the offline test was done immediately afterwards. This is important, not after one week. We told them do it immediately when the transformer is still in, with that uh, temperature profile, and the offline test confirmed the online results. So two bushings in the same transformer started to fail exactly in the same moment, which is something hard to believe, but this is exactly what happened. So conclusions. Uh, it is very important to uh, get the, maxim the maximum meaning of data in order to convert the data and information, information in actions. Otherwise, data alone are meaningless. And it is important to correlate more parameters in order to mm, extract the right information, apply the knowledge, and find what is the possible failure mode in a bushing, in a transformer, and so on. So if we look at the first case, the primary marking, marker that was triggering the attention of the utility was the capacitance step increase, so the leakage current. 
The assumption after that was the short circuit between layers, but the absolute value of that change was too small. If we look at the PD characteristics, it was a single arcing PD event occurring at the same time of the capacitance increase in the same bushing. Thanks to this additional information, the diagnosis was definitely an internal arcing, and we suggested to make a DGA test. So this is the prescriptive action. The result is that the DGA test show high acetylene and the bushing was replaced. Second case, the relative tan delta increase was the trigger again, giving the alarm. The assumption typically is moisture contamination. This is the first assumption. But the fact that we had partial discharges and these partial discharges were repetitive together with the tan delta increase with a pattern typical for uh, particles in oil was changing the diagnosis in metallic contamination. Make DGA and oil quality test very important sometime. The offline test was done. DGA was showing 9,000 ppm of hydrogen, low breakdown voltage, and then the bushing was replaced and inspected. Metallic particles were then found. Another important uh, example of correlation between partial discharges and, and the leakage current is the case of the resin impregnated uh, paper bushing. So what is the important part? That thanks to the PD feature, it was possible to see the typical shape of PD in a resin due to void the cavities. So without any doubt, there was a short circuit internal arcing. And the suggestion was to take the offline test, the typical offline, offline test in this case. And then it was confirmed and replaced. So the conclusions are that it is definitely critically important to monitor bushings. And uh, how to do that? It is not just the leakage current for the tan delta and capacitance, but also add please partial discharges. Temperature and load, the combination of these things are so important in order to do the uh, estimation of the failure mode. And thanks to the failure mode estimation, suggesting what is the best technical action. We have not to go in, as it was said before, under or over maintenance. You have to do the right thing at the right time. Sometimes can be the DGA test. Sometimes can be, for example, a tan delta tip up at different voltages. Sometimes it's tan delta at different frequencies. But you need to know exactly what to do in that moment. For example, a typical mistake is, as I said before, to switch off the transformer, the transformer cool down, and then you do the tan delta test, and that's it. Sometimes some defects are active only at a certain temperature. So you should. Uh, for example, switch off the cooling system, make the transformer to warm up a little bit, make the first test, wait two hours, do another test, and then do another test again. And uh, so online monitoring system, their rule is to tell you exactly what to do and when. This is the point. It is not to replace offline test. If we talk about partial discharges, not every system is suitable to do that. There are important elements that must be considered. The partial discharge systems must automatically remove the noise, remove the cross coupling from the different phases, and separate the partial discharges that are in the bushings from those in the main tank. Then the partial discharges must be measured continuously, not one, two, three times per day. Otherwise, things like the arcing event, you will not see that. And, and the arcing events must be detected and put in a, in a separate trend. So okay, this is everything on my side. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Marco, for that uh, interesting and uh, and I think enlightening uh, talk on online condition monitoring uh, with a focus on transformer bushings, which I think uh, you've explained clearly is such a, an important um, failure mode of transformers uh, globally and certainly in South Africa as well from that uh, paper that you cited, uh, which looked specifically at transformer failures in South Africa. So I think that's an interesting paper that needs to be referenced and, and uh, made available. Uh, and, and I certainly hope that I can do just that uh, to this audience, because I think it uh, will really help us in our own environment. So thanks very much, Marco. Great to have an international leader in this field uh, talk to us today.
Uh, it's a great honor to have had you. So now we move on to uh, our next presenter, uh, which is Luendran Mudley. Uh, and uh, Luendran comes from a very famous uh, company in, in, in the field of transformer uh, diagnostics. Uh, and I would like to introduce him now. So uh, Luendran holds a BSc electrical engineering degree and is a registered professional engineer. And on his graduation, he joined the local utility ESCOM and rose to senior levels within the substation space, focusing on life man management of HV plants, such as transformers, circuit breakers, capacitor banks, gas insulated switchgear, etc. He was also instrumental in the implementation of diagnostic testing. In 2007, Luendran joined Doble Engineering Company, and he currently heads up the Doble Engineering Africa office, responsible for Doble's business strategy on the African continent. He has been involved in transformer diagnostic testing and analysis for more than 20 years. Uh, he's been involved in transformer fleet assessment across the energy sector, which includes wind turbines, dry type, furnace transformer, rectifier transformers, etc. And he's personally been involved in the assessment of thousands of transformers uh, across Africa. So a person who can bring this uh, experience both at the utility level uh, as, as well as uh, you know in the OEM, uh, level uh, and 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 a broad experience uh, in the subject of uh, transformer uh, assessment uh, across the continent. So great pleasure to have you here, Lou uh, Your presentation is up, and we can see it clearly. Uh, so over to you now. If you can switch on your uh, camera and your mic, um, uh, Lou Endron. We can see your presentation, but we can't hear you yet. <laughs> okay, I may be missing something. I can see that your your uh, mic is on and your camera is on, but I'm not seeing you. Um, are you online, Luendron? Ah, there, we can see you now. Thank you. Yes, yes, that's much better. Sorry, uh, I'm just no going to bleed. I'm just going to blame the floods in uh, in Durban for that. Right. Okay, so thanks, Chris, for that uh, introduction. Uh, really appreciate it. And good afternoon to everybody. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about transformer fleet management by using health indices. Now, I want to emphasize at the start of the presentation that it's not the complete model we use, but bits of it to make the presentation a bit lighter. So here we go. Okay, so where is the starting point of all these uh, health indices and things like that? It's really starting at transformer testing, right? And South Africa, I believe, has been in a, in a great space here and for the last two decades has really done a lot of work in terms of offline testing, right? And it's something that is known, something that we do often and really get very excited about, right? Nothing much has changed. Uh, you know, over the years, you know, companies have tried to streamline the offline measurements, making it quicker and including Doble, which can reduce the testing time right down to two to three hours. But in essence, it's still a great bother. You know, it still will induce a lot of um, sun um, uh, skin damage from the sun, right? Now, as it well said in his presentation, is that electrical testing, the offline method, is generally uh, uh, triggered by the DGA measurements, right? And it's it's a quite simple thing to understand because there's a lot of time and effort needed uh, for these tests. Now, another test that's winning favor is the in-service survey test. So basically the idea here is to do as much as you can without taking out the transformer. Although, uh, as you would imagine, the number of tests are limited, right? Uh, uh, it's generally made up of your DGA. You can do infrared scanning. Uh, you can look at your furans, partial discharge scanning in terms of RFI and EMI alone. And you can use the international standards or even your own personal database uh, to benchmark these different transformers uh, across uh, your fleet. Right. What is also gaining popularity is the permanent online monitoring uh, in the form of DGA at moisture, P 
PD and bushings typically, but here you can really go overboard and monitor probably every part of the transformer. But these three um, seem to be a standard in South Africa. Now, all this testing has really produced a large and a rich environment of data, which is a good thing, right? For example, locally, <clears throat> we have electrical test records running into about 21 thousand transformers, SFRA traces about 28,000. And we just starting with partial discharge sitting almost at 10,000. Internationally, there's a huge amount of data. Uh, for example, Doble has data of about 55 million uh, tests, but that's across all the assets. All right, so what are we gonna do with this data? I think that's the thrust of my presentation is just the life after testing, right? So you have all the data, yeah, is what we've discussed. You want to do something to the data to produce some health indice or condition of your transformer. And praise normally helps pretty well, yeah. But if you look at this, the step from moving from the data to your health indices, it, it can be quite uh, easy. Um, the electrical uh, information and what you collect is the data. You need some form of diagnosis that then leads you to the end game, which is the condition of the uh, transformer. So condition is the important part. So let's look at the condition. Now, every person who owns a transformer, manages a transformer, wants it to be very reliable and very cheap to run, right? Now, how do you do this? Uh, I think it is great consensus in the world of transformers that the condition of the transformer is the most important thing. All right. And um, so if we understand the condition, we can then accurately determine uh, the transformer's uh, capability to, uh, to be reliable, right? So we need to look at some condition indicators, right? Now, as you can see here, I have two pictures. The first one is uh, Macaulay Culkin, which shows a very, very poor condition indicator. He's aged terribly. And on your right-hand side, you have a more graceful aging. Uh, of a person, possibly like uh, Chris Yellen. Right, so in order for us to understand the condition indicators, we need to examine how our transformers fail and why do they fail. And in order to do that, we then develop a system around that, right? So the best resource for this is the Seagray brochure 642, uh, the Transformer Reliability Survey. It is aging, it was published in 2015, but nevertheless, a very good source of information. It's comprehensive, it has 56 utilities, 21 countries, 964 known transformer failures. All right, so some conclusions that was drawn from this document was that uh, the failure pattern of transformers doesn't generally follow the bar top curve. Right, which is an important part. It also emphasizes the fact that uh, time-based maintenance, I, I think it's something we all know, uh, really doesn't work. You need to move more onto the condition of the transformer than anything else. Like many organizations, Seagray also will put out different types of failure classifications, right? Which can be uh, used as uh, your condition indicators, right? But I think uh, the best condition indicators to use is, um, is to look at the different parts of the transformer. And what has been successfully used um, for a long time is the dielectric, thermal, and mechanical stresses that the transformer um, has to deal with, right? Now, if you look at the uh, active part, the active part of the transformer uh, all the failures are generally linked to, to these three different types of stresses. So whether it's a dielectric, thermal, or mechanical stress. So straight away, we have now in identified our condition indicators. So with common sense, we can understand that if we know the condition of these um, uh, parts of the transformer or models of the transformer, we can get a pretty good accurate accurate um, overall condition of the transformer. Right, so this is a, a, a dielectric uh, fault starting from the left-hand side, right? Uh, easy dielectric fault, problems with insulation, 
right? Typically, problems with insulation. Yeah, we have two insulation faults. Then we have thermal. Thermal, obviously, coming from uh, overheating. Uh, overheating uh, in few ways. Overheating coming from uh, a metal to metal type of fault or um, metal covered by paper, uh, so to speak, right? Now, what also causes thermal faults and we need to guard against is cl clogging of the cooling ducts uh, with sludging from the transformer can also be counted as part of this. Overloading your transformer as well can be uh, included in this um, category as well. Then last of all, we have mechanical damage. Now, mechanical damage, um, is something that, uh, as um, Sidwell mentioned, uh, heavily a result of electromagnetic forces in the transformer, generally through, uh, through, through faults, uh, can really cause a problem, especially on the older units that hasn't been IEC uh, tested for short circuit events, right? And uh, generally, it's the consequence of loo loose clamping structures. Right, so now we have the indicators, dielectric, thermal, and mechanical. So how do we go about testing it? Right, so what's the trick here is that knowing that every single test that you perform, electrical measurement, has a place, right? And these different tests can be put into three different slots. That is your dielectric, thermal, and mechanical, right? So for SFRA, for example, down here, it only checks your mechanical integrity of the transformer, right? Um, so if you have a, um, a insulation fault in your transformer, SFRA is not going to see it, right? So you got to understand that each test will look for a, a specific fault. A, the other way uh, that you need to match it is also with the oil data. Right, uh, the oil and the electrical test must always match. And if you do your diagnosis properly, it will happen, right? There's a lot of other information you can also collect uh, in, in, in determining how to measure these indicators, right? Once you have, you know how to measure it. So for example, power factor measurements or tan delta uh, measurements and capacitance is an insulation, uh, is a dielectric uh, type measurement you can then start considering the failure modes uh, for these different types of conditions. So for dielectric, you can have uh, major insulation failure, minor. So major insulation will be power factor measurements. Minor can be ratio measurements. Uh, you're gonna check the leads, um, electrostatic shields and so forth. So thermal uh, also uh, mainly on the current carrying circuits, poor connections, circulating currents in, uh, in the core and so forth. And mechanical uh, damages it, um, is really uh, defined in terms of the loose clamping structure, but notwithstanding that, it can also be transport problems and, and so forth. It can be even shrinking of the, uh, the insulation or over time, right? Which causes the loose clamping structures. Okay, so just to recap now, uh, we have the data, right? From the electrical test, we're gonna do something which is the diagnostics. And we eventually want to come out with a model or the condition of the transformer based on this dielectric, thermal and mechanical condition. Why? Because all the faults that uh, the transformer sees will be fitted into one of these uh, classifications, right? So, um, right. So let's look at the data gathering. I think the data gathering is quite easy. This is just all your electrical measurements, your online measurements. It can be daunting, right? And um, the way you handle your data is quite important because it will lead to uh, uh, a low confidence of decision-making, right? And as Mark Twain said, uh, data is like garbage. You better know what you are going to do with it uh, it before you collect it. So uh, that is really the uh, electrical testing. So you, you do all your electrical testing, you collect the data and you just merely don't say the transformer has passed. You've got to put it into a condition uh, for the transformer. Otherwise it's garbage. Okay. So here's an example of a, um, of a, a local utility or a municipality that 
um, where I show the different manufacturers. Uh, now, this is just details from the nameplate. And strangely enough, uh, a lot of the municipalities across South Africa displayed the similar type of uh, manufacturers and so forth. And as you can see here, we have a large volume of uh, Asia transformers. Right. So that always piques your interest and asks the question why. Now, these Asia transformers were in the late 70s, 80s, and some even in the, in the early 90s, but not so much. Now, the reason why that happened is because of the political situation uh, in South Africa. A lot of the transformers were procured through Switzerland, who never had sanctions on anybody. All right. So most of our transformers were, uh, were sourced from there. So this is a good example of how transformer data can help in history. The other information you want to collect is uh, really everything you can get your hands on. Uh, transformer factory test reports, modifications, rewinds, and so forth. All adds value when you're looking at the uh, condition. What we tend to neglect is the transformer design information. Does the transformer have, for example, an electrostatic shield, uh, which then will make power factor measurements between those two windings sometimes almost impossible? Do you have a internally connected tertiary winding that will affect the SFRA measurements? Right? Do you have resistance uh, attached to the core uh, uh, to limit the current? Right. Um, if you have uh, surge resistors, for example, on windings or the tap windings, you need to know these things uh, in order to make a good assessment of your transformers. So data is an important thing. The next thing we go to is diagnostics. I mean, diagnostics is really what is the numbers telling you? How can I interpret it? Right. Most diagnostics should give you the location and the severity. Right. Uh, well, it goes without saying that a misdiagnosis can be very costly event. Right. Now, a lot of the um, diagnosis where you marrying electrical and uh, oil and so forth into it is very limited in terms of published data. It's generally trade secrets for most companies on how they combine the data and how they weight the data and so forth, right? So there is some level of uh, skill that is required and experience. Now, in this case, I can clearly say that uh, practice is required and it really reduces your imperfection. It doesn't make perfect, but it reduces the imperfection. Interpretation of the data can be quite rudimentary in some cases. Um, uh, you know, humans love numbers, I think, uh, because there's numbers that people live by, like uh, for the total combustible gas of 720. So I do nothing with my transformer until I hit the magic mark or, uh, you know, I wait for my transformer to hit uh, 100 ppm of hydrogen. Uh, so these numbers generally will take away a lot of our uh, engineering skill that is needed to look at it. So it's not looking at the transformer holistically. It's looking at just one piece of information. All right. DGA um, is the most powerful tool you can get on transformers. It can pick up dielectric and thermal faults, but it doesn't pick up any mechanical faults, right? Because the mechanical faults do not generate high temperatures. Right, there's a number of methods you can use really, uh, you know, everything is automated these days and you don't really need an expert oil guy. You can write the thing in your spreadsheet yourself. But there are areas of concerns, like the gas limits for IEEE, uh, the use of CO and CO2 on free breathing transformers, uh, what gives problems as uh, uh, Sidwell mentioned, that cannot be used in our cases. Uh, the IEC producing no codes, uh, these methods not looking at historical data, you know, the list can go on, but notwithstanding that, EGA is one of the best ways to look at transformers. In terms of power factor, you can't just rely on 0 0.5 and 1 anymore. So uh, insulation, um, uh, how insulation performs over its life is generally derived from, you know, a large history uh, of it, right? So cutoff limits that we normally use may not really be applicable. Exciting current measurements, the most significant thing here is the voltage at which you test, right? You can definitely uh, miss uh, a lot of it. Uh, 
The DC winding resistance, uh, people normally will talk about between five and 10%. Uh, you can get problems even at a 1% change, right? And again, in DC winding resistance, the, uh, the level of current being used is very important, uh, especially um, if you're looking for, uh, for example, a tap changer uh, contact problem. Sweep frequency, again, very difficult thing to uh, understand, uh, but it requires experience. I don't believe you need to be a rocket scientist to do that. It is just lot of, lots of experience. Partial discharge can get complicated uh, if you're doing uh, location with acoustic sensors, I think. But partial discharge over the years has become easy with great signal processing and very good software, uh, as we saw in the previous presentation, right? Few runs is always a hot topic. Uh, again, the magic number of 200 dp appears here, right? Uh, you must be cautioned uh, against that number. Uh, because there's many ways to interpret DP and to convert to convert furans to DP, and some of these methods can be very misleading. Uh, so you need to watch more the two FAL as opposed to the actual uh, DP value. So uh, that's in a nutshell is what the diagnosis uh, gives you problems. Right. Uh, so we're now going to look at. Uh, uh, developing the indices. Now, we, our life is governed by some indices. So let's look at the indice that we all know. So the indice that we know is uh, BMI indice or the fat indice, as I like to call it, right? Now, uh, it's been around since 1832. So it's a long time, right? Um, what does it do? It really just measures weight and height, right? So it's not really uh, that sophisticated. Right, um, it's used to diagnose how much of fat you are or fatness, uh, which I like to again call it. The measurement is rudimentary. You're just using kgs and meters, right? It's low cost. You can buy a scale and a tape measure and do the calculation. If you find problems with square roots, you can get a calculator or uh, squares. Um, it's fast, it's non-intrusive, right? The results are immediate because you have a reference uh, well, basically, it's just cheap and cheerful to get this measurement, right? According to this method, it is unambiguous. You're either fat or you're not fat, right? So what does the number 32 give us? The number 32 gives us obese, right? So you, you're obese. You, you, you become comfortable in your skin. But what does this indice not tell us? I think that's more important. It doesn't tell you why you are fat, what diseases you have, the amount of fat that you have, where you have the fat and so forth, right? So is BMI a health, uh, a health risk in this? Yes, it is, but is it a really reliable one? No, it's not, it's a rough estimate, right? So how do you make this rough estimate indicator into something that's usable and more valuable? You go back and do a lot more, a lot more other tests like lifestyle checks, smoking, over drinking, right? uh, blood pressure, uh, glucose level, you know, uh, and so forth, which you can then make it into a really good indice. The next indice that you need to watch out for is the tricky indice, I call it. So if you know this movie called The Rain Man, Nicolas Cage, uh, he said in the movie, there's a probability, there is a 50% probability that it will rain tomorrow. What he really means, what does he really mean? That he will never be wrong, yeah? So uh, whether it rains or doesn't rain, he's right. Right now, it not make might make it not make a, any impact on his life, but it can make certainly make a huge impact on yours. So the question is always look at the indice and ask what are you not telling me. Right. So uh, just very quickly, I'm just going to uh, summarize here uh, to look at a, a ratio method. Right. So in, when you're developing a health indice, right, you need to have a scoring matrix. Right. The scoring matrix gives consistency. To all your measurements. In the score, in this matrix, you also got to have levels of severity, right? And you must be able for the bad acting transformer to really stand out and not be masked. And to make everything fun, you can use different colors, uh, like the traffic signals.
So here's a typical uh, matrices that you can use. Uh, it's quite easy, uh, rudimentary, right? Uh, you will notice that it has a linear scale, uh, sorry, a log scale, and try to avoid using a linear scale because you will mask problems. Here we have just uh, five conditions, new, aging, uh, suspect, uh, unacceptable, and these are the definitions. And these are the actions that you require, right? So that's just your matrices. Then you can put this thing into a quite a simple table. I just cut this out from one of ours, where you look at the thermal condition, dielectric condition, and mechanical condition, and you get an overall condition, right? And you can score it uh, based on your fleet uh, assessment. So the colors, uh, like Sidwell mentioned, red, uh, obviously bad, uh, orange, suspect, need to do something, green, leave me alone. We also have the design uh, consideration in this, in this table because we have a large database. So we can go back and look at transformers of the same make, model, gear, whatever from the same factory and know their failure mode. And we all know that sister units uh, fail exactly the same. Right. So what is this presentation not telling you? Right. So it will not transform you into a transformer guru right but it's a good source of information it will not give you all your answers for your transformer issues but it will help you to better understand condition assessment will not automatically develop health indices for you but it will introduce you to what is possible and finally it will not increase your iq but neither will it decrease it i i thank you for your time thank you very much Luwendra. Uh, not only was that a touch of humor uh, much appreciated, uh, but also the uh, the amount of data that you've provided us with uh, is immense. And uh, you know we've been taken from this online measurement uh, that Marco was talking about uh, through the gathering of data uh, that you've you've talked about, and, uh, and and then how to interpret this data. Uh, and I just loved your comment about. Um, uh, from Mark Twain about the garbage. Uh, I mean, you, you have to know what you're doing with this data. Otherwise, you, it's, just, it's such a lot of effort to collect the data if you don't know what to do with it afterwards. So this is where experience and knowledge comes in with artificial intelligence, with uh, cloud-based information. I, I can, I'm beginning to get a feeling of what this subject is all about. Uh, but as you say, it's just a taste. Uh, because in 20 minutes, uh, that's all you can give us. But I think it's a very valuable uh, taste uh, and we're starting to get the flavor uh, of, of what this is all about. Uh, and certainly if you've got this data and you can make it systematic and you can analyze it and draw out conclusions, it becomes very, very powerful when you're trying to manage a fleet of 300 thousand MVA of installed transformer capacity at, at, at Eskom and a similar amount in, in municipalities. So absolutely fascinating for me. I've thoroughly enjoyed the first half and it's now my duty to uh, say that we're going to have a 10 minute comfort break. Uh, I think it's much needed, uh, certainly by me. Um, and uh, so uh, I'm calling a 10 minute comfort break. It's now, I'm going to say it's now, we're running a little bit late. Uh, but I'm going to say it's uh, uh, 1.30 at the moment, 1.30 p.m. At uh, 1.40, that's at, uh, just over 10 minutes. So it's given us a 12-minute comfort break to stretch our legs, uh, grab a cup of coffee or something, and um, relieve ourselves. <laughs> and we'll be back here at uh, 1.40. That's 20 to 2, if that's all okay with you. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. See you in about 10 minutes' time.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's exactly 1.40, 13.40, 20 to 1. Uh, we're going to resume uh, the webinar now. It's been a fascinating uh, first uh, session uh, with some fantastic speakers, Sidwell Matwekwa, Marco Tozzi, Dr. Marco Tozzi, and the Wendron Moodley. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce an old colleague of mine. Uh, we have known each other for many years, and uh, that is Alexander Dirks. So Alexander has over 30 years of experience in protective relay and meter testing, as well as high voltage plant testing. He received his practical training at Eskom Distribution in Brackenfell before joining Omicron, uh, Omicron Electronics in Austria as sales and applications engineer. Since 1997, he's been managing Electrix as the managing director, and uh, Electrix is the exclusive distributor for Omicron equipment in, in South Africa. Alex has delivered dozens of papers at local and international conferences and symposiums on subjects such as protective relay testing, maintenance and diagnosis of power transformers, current transformers and other substation assets, as well as aspects of power uh, power system simulation. So I don't know anybody uh, as experienced uh, in the um, uh, testing field in, in South Africa across uh, all ranges of equipment, as mentioned. Uh, and it's a great pleasure then for me to introduce to you, Alexander. We can see your presentation, so over to you now. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me? Perfect, and you can see my presentation already. Good afternoon, listeners, and thank you for joining us on this really well-organized webinar. Thank you, Chris, also for taking the initiative of organizing this webinar. I think a very appropriate and a very timely um, topic to cover at this, in this time and age. I'm going to talk about the offline testing and diagnosis tools for power transformers, and I've added a little bit to that to test or not to test. And this has already been coming out a little bit from one of the previous presentations from Sidwell, et cetera, whether to over-test or to under-test a transformer, that really is the question. And I'd like to unpack this topic a little bit to you as the listeners. Let's get my focus back here. So to test or to not to test? Well, obviously I do not want to scare you with this doomsday picture. Um, I think the residents of El Dorado Park will attest to that, having sat without electricity for five days over the Easter weekend due to a transformer failure. And obviously, this is the kind of thing that we want to, to prevent. Firstly, because we obviously do not want to lose the power transformer hardware. We do not want to have damage to the secondary equipment in a substation, neighboring equipment. We do not want to have exterior periods of loss to, of supply to our customers. And lastly, obviously, we want to limit and reduce personal safety risk, not to only to the utility personnel, but also to people that live nearby the substation, as, as well as the firefighting personnel and so forth. We've already seen some transformer failure statistics. I'm going to draw on one from Seagray, which is actually also from 2015, um, from working group A2.37, 22,000 grid transformers. They all paint a very similar picture. The main reasons for transformer failures are due to the windings, are due to the bushings, as well as to the, due to the tap changer, as indicated here on the presentation. And all of those together um, are, are responsible for more than 80% of the failures of a transformer. The only point that I'd like you to remember from my presentation is the following. What revenue is lost for a 20 MVA transformer not supplying load? And the answer to that question is 1 million Rand a day. So forget everything else I'm gonna say, just remember that figure. A transformer like shown in this picture here, not supplying its customers, loses you as a utility 1 million Rand a day. And Admittingly, I've done some easy um, calculations here, 20 MVA times 16 hours of full load times eight hours of half load, assuming 250 Rand per kilowatt hour, that comes to a million Rand a day. That's what we need to remember when we have a transformer like that not being able to operate. Okay, and then the other question that comes to the question of whether to test or not to test is actually based on a principle 
that Maimonides um, um, put forward, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you will feed him for a lifetime. And I've converted that a little bit to what I call the electric principle. Give a utility a finished test report and they can supply power for a year. Teach a utility to test themselves and they can supply power for a lifetime. It really is important that the people that operate the transformers and that are responsible for the transformers know how to interpret the data that they get from transformers, know how to test the transformer and know how to take that transformer data forward when um, you're operating that transformer. And this is really the purpose of my presentation is I'd just like to give you an overview of the different tests available. This is kind of, I'd like to show you my toolbox um, there is no such silver bullet tool in there. They're all different tools and they need to apply it at different times of the day and at different times um, of uh, the transformer lifetime. They basically um, put together into basic diagnostics, standard electrical tests, as well as advanced di diagnosis or electrical tests. And I'm gonna briefly just cover it with you all the different tests in there. Um, just to give you an overview of what the different tests that are available um, to diagnose and to assess a transformer. Starting off with the basic diagnostics, obviously there's the visual inspection, looking for oil leaks, looking to oil levels, the silicon breathers, looking at the tap change counter, listening to the transformer, listening to the noise of the transformer, listening to the noise of the tap change operating. The second point being the dissolved gas analysis, taking an oil sample, checking for the hydrogen, checking for the methane, the ethylene and the acetylene, and possibly plotting this on the Duval triangle, as it was already mentioned, and then making deductions from that, how good the oil is and what's happening inside the transformer at that particular time, um, time and uh, point in time. And thirdly, a very good and very common test still used a lot is insulation resistance measurements. Just using a five kV mega and performing a test between the windings, between the winding and tank, and making sure that the insulation is still adequate and is still good. Then coming to the standard electrical tests. And the standard electrical tests, are basically four of them, and these are really tests that everybody can do. I mean, with a reasonable amount of training, everybody can do these. The short circuit impedance test or the leakage reactance test, this really looks at the transformer, you apply a short circuit on the secondary of the transformer, and then you look at the reactance of the transformer, your primary or your HV reactants, as well as your secondary reactants. And you then make sure that the impedance that you measure is the same as was tested at the factor acceptance test stage or at um, that is um, printed on the nameplate. It normally should, as the C grade guide 445 says, within 3% of the nameplate value that you have. As you can see here, these results that I'm showing here are well within the 3% that um, should have been measured. The second test to do is the winding, the static winding resistance test. And this could be either a single phase or a three phase DC test. And it's very important that when you do this test that you firstly charge that winding properly before you take a measurement and afterwards, very important to discharge the winding again before you disconnect any um, leads from the test transformer. The point here is that we are obviously measuring the R1 and the R2 or the direct resistance of the winding um, inside the transformer of the copper of the, inside the transformer. And you then plot those for uh, versus the tap position of the transformer you obviously want to make sure that all the lines, the resistances are all in a reasonably straight line. Secondly, that the three phases are on top of each other, are virtually identical because the winding from phase A, phase B, or phase C should be exactly the same because it's an identical winding. So they really should be the same. And the difference in measurement between the different phases should deviate by no more than 2%. And this is again, a guide that is given in Seagray guide 445. <clears throat> you have obviously different types of tap changes around. The one with a tap reversal switch at tap number nine, then you measure a V M shape as is shown in this M graph here. Or if you don't have a tap reversal switch, then the resistances all should be in a very straight line 
as indicated in the bottom graph on my slide here. Then we come to the excitation current measurement, and this can be done either at high voltage or at low voltage. However, it's very important if you do it at low voltage to do it after demagnetizing the transformer to get any meaningful results out of that. With this measurement, we're looking at the iron losses of the transformer, or we're characterizing those. And they really, you should have, particularly for a star connected winding, this typical HLH current distribution, the outer phases being slightly higher current to the center phase. And also you obviously want to make sure that the outer phases are more or less the same. The reason being that the transformer is a symmetrical device. So the A phase and the C phase should really have the same current and the center phase having an equal or imbalanced flux path, having a slightly lower current. You can also plot these currents for all the different tap changer positions. And there you should then also see the same pattern, the outer phasing being slightly higher than the center phase. Plus with increasing tap number, the excitation current is gonna slowly rise up as you are increasing the tap number. The reason being that as you're reducing the number of windings in your circuit, you need more current to energize your winding. And the last of the standard tests is the transformer turns ratio test. And the transformer turns ratio test really characterizes the ideal transformer formation of a transformer, the N1 to N2. It is typically a three phase voltage test. And with that, you can then also measure not only the ratio, but also if you energize the transformer with a three phase supply, you can also do the vector group measurement or the, the, the phase angle shift. If you have a YD1, it should be a 30 degree phase shift depending on either leading or lagging if it's in a YD1 or a YD11. And you can plot those also versus the different tap numbers. And again, they should all be on a very straight line from tap number one up to for instance, tap number 17 in this case. Each phase should be on top of each other because the three windings are again, very much identical. So the A phase, the B phase and the C phase should be right on top of each other with regard to the ratio. And also the ratio should deviate no more than 0.5% from the nameplate ratio given on the transformer nameplate. And this is an actually not a guide. This is a standard from the IEC 60076-1 standard and which specifies a 0.5% deviation. And in the bottom graph here, you can see the deviation and obviously the limits of 0.5% plus or minus. And in this case here, these test results show that we are well within those limits. Those are the four standard electrical tests or offline electrical tests. Coming to the advanced diagnosis and electrical tests, I first would like to spend some time on the dynamic winding resistance test. And this specifically looks at the tap changer and the onload tap changer of a transformer. This is also a DC test, but it's a DC continuity test measuring the continuity of the tap change process from one tap to the next and ensuring that the tap changer is, the tap change process is continuous and that it's the same for all the different taps as well as all the different phase and, uh, phases involved. And for this, we use the so-called ripple measurement or the OLTTC scan. And this is a typical example of the OLTC scan where we are measuring or recording the DC current. In this case here, we're injecting 10 amps. And then we go through the tap change process from one tap to the next. You will see the first tap, uh, the first diverted resistor being switched into circuit, two diverted resistors in parallel, the second diverter resistor in series, and then there being a little bit of a winding that needs to be discharged, hence the discharge curve, as you can see here. And for a good tap changer, these curves should be all on top of each other for the different taps and transitions, both tapping up and tapping down, as well as obviously also for the different phases. That means for a 17 tap, tap changer, this could be as many as 96 test results that we are plotting in this case on top of each other. Where the ripple measurement comes in is that we are comparing this steady state current with this peak current down here. And in this case, for instance, the drop would be in the region of 40% because we're dropping from 10 amps down to six amps. This really depends from tap changer to tap changer. And it, it, it cannot be, um, there's not a standard 
amount of ripple that you will have on different tap changes. And then you plot this ripple versus the tap changer position. And in this case here, you can see that the triple ripple increases from 25% up to 40%, then back to 25%. The reason why the ripple increases for higher tap numbers is because the amount of winding in circuit is bigger and it has a bigger effect. Hence, there's a slightly bigger ripple in this case. As long as the three phases are right on top of each other, and as long as they are more or less in the same order of magnitude, this tap changer can be diagnosed as being good. As soon as this ripple measurement starts shooting up to 50%, 100%, when it's normally around about 25%, that is an indicator that there's something wrong with that tap changer, because then you will have an interruption in this current here. And this is a clear indicator that there is an issue with this specific tap changer. So this is a very good diagnosis method to look at the health of the on load tap changer and tap changes being one of the main areas of problems in a transformer. We've already heard quite a bit being spoken about the 10 delta measurements, mostly on bushings, but it can also be used very much in the same way on windings. This is the dissipation factor between the HV and the LV winding. And secondly, also between the actual bushing and the actual main conductor and the C1 measurement being the test tap of the um, uh, bushing. Here, the important point is to firstly look what is the temp delta measurement at 50 Hertz. And yes, I agree with Luendron that the basic rule of 0.5 um, being okay and anything up to 1% being acceptable cannot be taken as gospel. It is very important to look at more. And in our case, we also say is to look at the shape of the frequency response of the 10 delta um, versus frequency curve. And if this curve is an increasing curve, this is almost like a limited dielectric response analysis. And if it's an increasing curve, it means that your insulation system is still good. If it starts becoming a decreasing curve, that means your insulation in time, in terms in, internally of your oil impregnated um, paper system is starting to deteriorate. So in this case here, for instance, the blue curve, which is the ICH curve is still good, but your ICL is starting to show signs of aging, apart from the 10 delta measurement obviously increasing in that specific case. So the 10 delta measurement at 50 Hertz is like a spot check, but looking at the frequency shape gives you a second degree of um, confidence in terms of your measurement. And then this is the response curve for, for instance, for bushings, and I think we've already talked a lot about this. This also showing you where we stand at, in terms of the actual measurement at 50 Hertz, but also looking at the shape of the curve. If it's increasing, it means it's still good. The polarization losses of this bushing are still predominant, and that means the insulation is still good inside this um, bush, in, inside these bushings that are shown here. Then we have this frequency response analysis. And this is a very good technique for looking at the geometrical integrity of the transformer. It is a graphical technique. It compares the different phases against each other. And you can then, by looking at the different frequency areas, you can then diagnose, is it more core related? Is it more bulk winding related? Is it more interturn related? And from that, make a deduction on if anything geometrically has changed inside the transformer. If the core has changed or the, has been damaged during transport, for instance, or if a bulk winding has shifted, or if there's an interturn fault in your interturn windings, which would show more in this high frequency um, area that we see here ab above 20 kilohertz and below 200 kilohertz. Anything above 200 kilohertz really is tap change lead and connection lead related and is of very little significance in terms of diagnosing the transformer. We've heard quite a bit about the online the partial discharge measurements. And yes, partial discharge measurements, as the name says, is important to diagnose a, um, a partial discharge or a partial breakdown of the insulation inside a transformer. And this is really a very good way to detect um, if you have any such uh, early um, breakdowns inside your transformer. In, um, you can do it online, but you can also do it offline. 
and then obviously diagnosing it and measuring the peak partial discharge that you're measuring and looking at the trend of that is really a very good indicator how good your insulation is inside your transformer. And then lastly, the dielectric response measurement. And this is really to measure the moisture inside the solid insulation of the paper. Note it's in the solid insulation of the paper, not in the oil. And this is a non-intrusive way to measure the moisture in the solid insulation of the measurement. It is basically a 10 delta measurement over a very large frequency range, typically in the region of 0.1 microhertz all the way up to one kilohertz. And from this shape of this curve, we can then determine what the actual moisture by using certain modeling techniques is inside the transformer. And in this case, 1.1% in the solid insulation would, in the paper would mean it's a dry transformer. And then there are certain standards in terms of IEC 600422, which say anything less than 2.2% is dry, anything less than 3.5% is moderately wet, anything less than 4.7% is wet. And obviously, if it's very wet, meaning greater than 4.7%, the transformer should not be used at all. And this is also the curve that we are measuring when we're doing the Winnington Delta or the Bushington Delta measurement. We're only measuring a very short portion of this curve here between typically 15 Hertz and 500 Hertz. And as this curve shifts to the right as the transformer ages, that's where we then start measuring the decreasing response of this frequency versus the increasing response that we saw earlier. And this is really what happens in the aging of a transformer um, and really gives us a very good indicator how good um, the insulation inside the transformer is. Note, this works for oil impregnated paper systems. So for the transformer itself, as well as obviously for um, oil impregnated paper bushings or OIP bushings. So in conclusion, power transformers are the most valuable asset in our power system. I think we all know that and we are well aware of that. And that's why we're also attending the seminar here today. Huge revenue is lost when power transformers are not supplying power. Remember the 1 million lost per day for a 20 MVA transformer not supplying its customers. Testing and diagnosis of power transformers can prevent failures. There are basic diagnostics that can be done, which consist of visual inspection, DGA, and insulation resistance measurements. There are standard electrical tests, which consist of the short circuit impedance, the winding resistance, excitation current, and the transformer turns ratio test. And then there are advanced electrical tests, which consist of the dynamic winding resistance, which is specifically useful for the OLTC, winding 10 delta, bushing 10 delta, sweep frequency response analysis, partial discharge, and dielectric response analysis available. And very important, none of these tests are the silver bullet. It's important to use the right test at the right time and also to use these tests against each other and confirm results from one test with another test to make sure that you don't either pass or condemn a transformer just on one measurement alone. And lastly, very important, teaching to fish is crucial to feed for a lifetime. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'm, I'm available for questions later, obviously, but Chris, back to you. Wow, thanks so much, Alex, uh, for that enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, telling us about the whole toolbox of offline testing. And, and as you know, Marco told us about the online testing, uh, which uh, you know can indicate uh, as an early measure uh, uh, you know, that there is a problem somewhere and then you have to do the right uh, offline testing uh, to get to the bottom of the problem. Uh, so I think we're beginning to see, uh, you know, an approach. And, and uh, Luendran told us about how, uh, you know, one has to use data. In other words, if you've got data for a whole fleet of transformers, not only in South Africa, but globally, uh, from, for example, from a particular manufacturer, then how valuable uh, this analysis can be if you've got the data and you can analyze it using the right intelligence. So uh, I think we're starting to get the picture, but now it's a great pleasure. And by the way, thank you very much, Alexander. That was a wonderful presentation, uh, very useful and um, uh, in guiding us. So uh, the next presentation is by Dr. Luke van der Zell. 
Uh, he's all the way uh, at the moment uh, from uh, North Carolina. There's Charlotte in North Carolina, one of the world's great research bodies, uh, EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, uh, which, uh, of which Eskom is a member and many utilities around the world are, member, uh, are members. And, and, and they provide invaluable uh, research and assistance to utilities globally. And so uh, Luke is phoning in, uh, dialing in from the USA. But it's it's so interesting to know that he's a South African from Joburg, or shall we say, from Rudapuert. <laughs> now, now, now in the USA. Uh, wonderful to see South Africans doing great things uh, internationally. So uh, Luke is a principal technical executive in the substations program at EPRI. He manages, executes, and publishes research in power transformers, SF6 insulation, SF6 leak detection, uh, gas insulated substations, geomagnetically induced currents and partial discharge detection. In addition to managing a wide portfolio of research projects within EPRI labs, uh, uh, Luke also manages a portfolio of research projects in labs outside of the USA. Uh, Luke's research extends beyond the lab into an array of field applications in EPRI member substations, including ESCOM. <laughs> uh, so uh, he helps in applying the practical aspects of EPRI's uh, research results. Luke is a graduate of the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, where he obtained his doctorate in electrical engineering in 1993. He's over 30 years experience in the power uh, industry and is an active member of both CGRE and IEEE. You know, all these people and speakers today that we've had, they're all kind of colleagues and friends, both locally and internationally. And it's wonderful to be able to bring them together and, and allow them to present to you to bring real expertise uh, locally and globally uh, to you, uh, the user, uh, the people that are trying to solve uh, particular problems out there. So over to you, Luke, we can see your presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Chris, for that introduction and for the opportunity and uh, for bringing together people on this very important topic. We're going to talk about global perspectives on transformer reliability and maintenance. And when you think about EPRI, Obviously, the first thing you think about is the R in EPRI, that's the research side. But when you think global perspective, if you know a little bit about EPRI, you may think, well, uh, is it perhaps US centric? Is it perhaps only what's happening in the United States? And, and the answer is uh, absolutely not. Uh, EPRI has a very global perspective. Those uh, stars on the graph show you where we have uh, EPRI offices, and you'll be pleased to see the star down in South Africa. And it is of interest to you, I'm sure, to know that over 100 utilities outside of the US are EPRI members. And that accounts for over a quarter of our revenue. And that's important because when we're thinking about the transformer global issues, it is helpful to know that the perspective we're applying to the research does apply to you as well. And in my presentation, I'm going to be talking through about five examples of the research we're doing that reflects that global perspective. So when we think about the uh, EPRI research, the important uh, perspective is where does it fit in in the entire EPRI scheme of things? If you're not familiar with EPRI, we do research all the way from nuclear, nuclear power all the way through to the customer, to integrated grid, energy services, the entire spectrum. And within that entire chain, you can see this one block here, this uh, green circle with the power lines. It's where I do my research is within the transmission and distribution infrastructure. And within that research uh, block, we have the transformer research. Now, I'll tell you one more thing about EPRI that will put it in perspective. You heard some excellent presentations from the suppliers and the vendors. And you will also be familiar, of course, on the other side of the spectrum, the very good fundamental research that's performed in universities and in national labs. So you can think of those as two ends of the spectrum. On the very left-hand side, universities are doing critical long-term research that is by definition and needs to be highly academic in nature with a long-term application. On the right-hand side, we have the critical deployment. Somebody's 
uh, go to deploy these and make the products and be in the vendor space. And you've heard good presentations on those. EPRI uh, straddles this middle area of applied research. We do research which has very short uh, timelines, uh, two to three years. We do research that is saying, if we're doing research, you should be able to use those results uh, in, in the near term. And to that end, I'm going to quickly talk through five short examples of the kinds of research we do. You can imagine with the bro broad research portfolio, it's going to be a bit of a flyover, beginning with the flyover of one of our laboratories in Western Massachusetts on the East Coast of the United States. And within that laboratory, we built a full research substation to answer a very important global need, not only in the US and around the world, but in Southern Africa too. And that is how do you intelligently specify online monitors? You've heard good presentations about online monitors, but how can you gain some insights into how they would perform? So here's a slightly closer view of the substation. And in this substation, we're able to do something quite unique. We're able to take up the widest range of all of the different online monitoring technologies, deploy them in the substation and do something that you'd never want to do on your grid. And that is intentionally introduce faults into the transformers. So we say, what would it look like if we had a fault developing in this transformer and what would the online monitors show you? And then we do that again and again against a very well-defined test protocol. So you can see a well-defined test plan, multiple stresses, and of course we're third party. We have no uh, dog in the fight. We can say, here is the data. Here are how these monitors perform with response to the same faults introduced into the transformer time and time again. It's really a, a privilege to be able to introduce those faults many times reset the clock and rerun them. At the same time, you also want to know another important question. Fine, the monitors perform to a certain uh, expectation straight out of the box, but how did they perform over the long term? This substation is in Western Massachusetts, happens to get really cold in winter, really hot in summer, and we're able to learn over years and years what is the total life cycle cost of these monitors? And then utilities take this information and they help it guide their specifications. And every utility makes different uh, decisions on their needs and the data is used to help them make those important decisions. It's a, an exciting uh, piece of work because these online monitors are really critical in your strategy for long-term performance and maintenance. But what about the very, very short-term need? What if you don't have an online monitor installed yet and you have a transformer or a bushing in distress? So now I'm gonna move on to the second uh, area of research. There's, so there's a global need for really quick insights on transformers and bushings that are in distress. Let's picture you have a transformer that from your next oil sample has started to gas. What do you do? Well, you want an answer really quickly. Could you get a quick and continuous view, for example, of the partial discharge activity without having to do any complex installation? Well, to meet those needs, EPRI has developed a wide suite of wireless monitors that last for 10 years and are magnet mounted and could go straight onto the transformer. So you may say, 10 years of wireless, that seems impossible. How, do you, how would you do that? And the secret source, if you like, is distilling the high frequency signals with a lot of data intelligently into just a few metrics, a few numbers that you can then transmit wirelessly. Because you can imagine transmitting just a few numbers wirelessly is really efficient. You could do that without running your battery flat. And in this way, we can quickly deploy online monitors onto the transformer. You, have, you heard Marco talk about the importance of online monitoring of PD. It comes and goes. You need to look at it continuously. So in this approach, we've developed a suite of monitors that can uh, 
measure, for example, partial discharge, and then send those metrics straight to your desk without an outage and getting it uh, to you really quickly. I'm going to digress ever so slightly to say, in that suite of monitors, there are also monitors to measure geomagnetically induced currents. So if you have conductors coming out of your transformer, these same wireless monitors in a different form can clip onto the conductors and measure geomagnetic currents. And the reason I digress is there were some good questions in the Q&A. And while I'm on the slide, I thought I would just touch on that so that you could bring it to your attention. I'll show you an example. There was a utility in the US close to my hometown that had a transformer that was gassing. And by magnet mounting these acoustic emission monitors on the transformer and observing the signals over a few months, we were able to show the utility, well, the signals are most intense and hence located around the bottom of the high voltage bushing connection. Obviously a much higher risk scenario than you could just interpret from the dissolved gas analysis alone. So you can see that those results could help the utility making an important decision on what to do with that critical asset. All right, I'm gonna to change topics now. We're gonna breeze through some of the research topics we're doing. And another global need that we have all around the world is can we reduce transformer fires and can we extend transformer life? And one of the opportunities that are open to doing that is alternative fluids. There are alternative fluids, natural and synthetic esters that hold uh, promise and are being applied in many transformers, including in Eskom, that hold the promise of both of those opportunities. But they are new and emerging technologies, and we are doing extensive research on behalf of the utilities to understand the extension, potential extension of life from adding these fluids. Can you actually have a transformer that lasts longer? And the reduction in fire. And the results are very encouraging. Not fast, these are difficult tests. You have to accelerate age in model transformers over a number of years. The tests you see in front of you have been running for a total of 14 years. Many of my years of research have been attending these uh, research uh, transformers. And we are learning about the degree to which these novel fluids and these alternative fluids can extend the life and reduce fires. And of course, a final uh, benefit is these alternative fluids are often highly biodegradable. So if you do get a spill, the impact on the environment is lower. So exciting work and another example of a global need where there is research being done. The uh, next opportunity that we're doing significant research on, and the, pic the picture you see here is our laboratory, our research substation, and a close-up of it, is research on the oil-free bushings. It was brought out so nicely in these presentations, the importance of taking close care of your bushings because they can be a cause of failure. Now, a bushing is a few tens of thousands of rands, no big deal, but the big deal, of course, is a bushing failure can take out a multi-million dollar transformer. So for numerous reasons, bushing failures are important. And one of the approaches to reducing the impact of transformer bushing failures is moving to oil-free bushings. Uh, polymer bushings, resin impregnated paper, resin impregnated synthetic. And there are obviously the critical questions that come up that are important that you are applying your mind to for oil bushings. How do they fail? How rapidly do they fail? How do you monitor them and how do they, how do the monitoring signals progress as failure progresses? So in the research laboratory, in our, in our laboratory, we have research tanks that have both the oil free and the traditional OIP, oil impregnated paper bushings, researching these failure modes. Critically important for the, the, the entire world, including uh, Southern Africa. Last but not least, I'm going to talk about a final topic, and then we will uh, hand back over to Chris. And this final topic is to what degree can we use robotic solutions to help us with transformers? 
robotic solutions are really cool, they're really exciting, but is there a value proposition for them? As neutral third party researchers, we're able to answer the hard questions, not can you, but should you, uh, and to what degree can they help? So in every one of these photographs is from either our research labs, this is our research lab, this is our research lab, or some pilots in the field where we have been researching transformer inspections using uh, UAVs, transformer inspections using underground robotics. And not only can you go to a substation, can you deploy this technology and can you fly it, but this tantalizing question, could you potentially do this in an automated fashion? Could you have a robot waiting there in the substation and then on demand rather than you send someone out, could it scan the station for you and should it? Is there a value proposition? And as good researchers, we have a very well-defined test protocol in our laboratories. We take all of the robotic solutions to exactly the same torture trials, if you like, the same roadmap, the same environmental conditions, the high electric fields, the high magnetic fields, the rain spray, and we learn together so that utilities can ask themselves, is this something that is ready for prime time? What are the challenges I'm likely to face? And how could I use these results? And from the utilities perspective, in, including, as, as Chris said, including, including Eskom, the opportunity that the EPRI research provides is the collaboration. It provides that collaboration that says, together, rather than each utility individually, could we together collaboratively answer these questions in, a more, uh, in, in an effective way. An effective way, first of all, against well-defined test protocols, and also a cost-effective way through the collaboration of the research. Because not only do we collaborate on the technologies and the research, but every utility that joins in collaborates on their, on their funding and participation. So thanks for the attention. And I look forward to the questions at the end. And Chris, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Luke. Uh, I'm really blown away by the, the exciting uh, work that you're doing and the enthusiasm with which you've presented it. it it's like, for me, it's like gripping uh, to, to, to hear what is going on. Uh, and, 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 and it's wonderful to know that a Joburg boy is there on the job. <laughs> and what a pleasure it has been to have you here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask all our presenters to switch on their microphones. Uh, quite a few of the presenters uh, have overrun their allocated times, and this is eating into our Q&A space, but we'll carry on a little bit longer uh, if uh, our presenters have got the time uh, to, to stay with us. Uh, we won't go on too long, though, because I know uh, not only presenters, but also the viewers uh, are very time constrained. Uh, but it's been an absolute pleasure to host this lineup of uh, uh, true experts uh, from ESCOM. Uh, from EPRI, from Camlin, um, uh, from Doble, and, and from uh, Electrix uh, representing uh, Omicron equipment. So it's, I think it's fair to say we have here in our midst world leaders uh, experienced both at the user level, utilities, at the research, the R&D level, uh, at the OEM level, and at the sort of providing solutions to real problems. And uh, we've brought this together. And, and I think this is just the start. Uh, it's been very valuable. You know, Alex mentioned about the cost of a transformer failure, 20 MBA, a million rand a day. You know, that is just the loss of revenue to the utility. That doesn't even take into account the loss to the economy, the loss of product production, uh, which can be mm. an order of magnitude or even two orders of magnitude higher than that one million a day. So that one million a day, if you look at the full costs uh, of not just the loss of revenue, but the loss of re the repair uh, in a day. So it's, I think, if anything, Alex, you've been a conservative engineer, you've understated the, the situation. We should know that these things are massively disruptive and that failure five days over Eastern El Dorado Park, I mean, it doesn't just have economic consequences, it has social and political uh, implications. 
that are very far reaching. Transformers are the mainstay of the electrical power system from generator step up transformers, transmission interconnectors from the different voltages through to distribution transformers down to the last mile, the customer mini substations, pole mounted transformers, uh, they all part of it. And I, I, I want to get this kick off. One of the questions, I can't remember who it was from, and, and I'd like an answer on this is, to what extent is load shedding, this frequent switching uh, that we're experiencing sometimes twice a day, three times a day, four times a day as a result of load shedding, you know, the municipalities are, are crying and saying that this is messing up their switch gears, messing up their transformers, is causing failures, fires, etc., etc. I want to know from the transformer experts, uh, if you have an old fleet of transformers, is frequent switching a problem for the transformer? I'm not talking about switch gear and cable joints and things, but for the transformer, how damaging is frequent switching caused by load shedding uh, uh, to, to transformer insulation and to failures of transformers? I, 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 perhaps I want to throw this at Sidwell. I know Sidwell Eskim sometimes has to answer a lot of questions, but I think you are at, at the brunt of things. Uh, Eskim is at the center of uh, load shedding. Um, but it's not the only problem. The problems on the distribution networks are legendary. But what is the impact of load shedding on transformers in transmission and distribution networks? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, we've lost your sound there, Sidwell. Could you just check if your mic is on? Uh, am I yeah. on now? Yep, you're on. Okay. okay. Yes, thank you. Right. Uh, I think that uh, the fundamental thing that you have to agree on is switching is stressful to a transformer. Uh, that, that cannot be, be denied. And uh, if you switch on frequently, um, and at this time you will know that if there's been load shedding, when you return your transformer into service, it's not even a, a control taking of load. So with that switching also, there is a, a abrupt taking of load, which is very stressful to a transformer. However, I know these folks called transformers, they, they, they are strong and, and then they, they can take those bumps. So in as much as uh, load shedding has an impact, I will be careful at looking at it as a, a primary reason to, to kill a transformer. If it finds a transformer that is already weak in a particular area, that can then cause havoc. For example, we mentioned here uh, an old transformer. If, 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 if the insulation is really reduced, the, sorry, the insul insulation strength is reduced, that will be the, the primary factor to it. And then it's easy for the switching back to drive that transformer into failure. Or if the clamping is also not adequate, um, because we know this even from the FAT point that switching impulse is one of the stressful things on the transformer insulation. So I will say, yes, it has an impact, but I will be careful in, 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 in looking at it as a, a primary reason. Um, on the response that I've mentioned there, I said also, it will be an interesting thing to build a, a very known case study around this. Take the transformers that probably fail after returning from uh, uh, load shedding and all those things and, and see what are the things or that caused it to fail, you know? Yeah. And then we can make some conclusion from there. At this stage, I know the discussion and all that, but for my tech and uh, the experience I have on transformers, I will not be uh, bold enough to put it as a primary reason. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, thanks very much, Sidwell. If I'm gonna ask all our presenters to keep the answers as short and sharp as possible, because we've got a lot of questions. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to get through them all, but I want to home in on a few that I think are interesting uh, to, to, to the listeners. Uh, Ian Gray asked the question, Eskim has installed over 500 online dissolved gas analysis uh, systems. Uh, was this program effective? What was the return on investment and how many of these units are still in operation today? I, I'm going to throw, uh, sorry to do this again to you, Sidwell, but, but this is really aimed at Eskom this particular question, and if you can keep it as short as possible uh, about these dissolved gas analysis analyzers. Uh, thank you, sir. I will do so. Uh, the, the experience has not been good. Um, I can say we, uh, even the return on investment was not that much. It's a subject that has been discussed briefly. I think there were so many shortfalls 
in the issues of case analy uh, online case analyzers, communications and things like that. So we are working on improving that, but our face experience was not good. Thanks for that. Uh, another, another thing that I'd like to uh, look at now, and I'm going to uh, perhaps throw this at you, Alexander. Um, you know, for, uh, the, the person who asked this question is unknown. It's just a guest. He says here, for the repair of transformers, should the transformers be subjected to all routine tests called for in SANS 676, the standard, irrespective of the failure mode? So I think the question is, if you have a repaired transformer, do you need to do the whole suite of tests uh, irrespective of the failure mode, or can you be a little bit more selective to save time and money? Well, I, I think it really depends what the repair has been, but if it's a full um, rewinding of the transformer and a full untanking of the transformer and a full drying and everything again, it's like a recommissioning of a new transformer. It needs to be taken through the whole procedure again. And, and yes, everything needs to be done, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for, for that. Uh, thanks for keeping it short and sweet. We, we have to, I'm trying to get, a, get through of, uh, these. Uh, I see an interesting question from uh, Prince Moyer, senior executive at Eskom. Uh, and he asked this question again to you, Alex. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I, I'm chuckling at this question because maybe it should be taken offline. Uh, but he says, yeah, he says, what are the recent improvements in on-site testing that we never used to have? Okay, that's a good question for you. The second question is, what instruments would you recommend that a, a, ut a utility buys? What should he go and buy? I'm going to pass on the second one. I'm going to pass on the second question. <laughs> Thanks for the question, said, Prince. Uh, back over to Alex. Uh, what, what I, know, I know this is like a, like, it could be a curved ball or it could be staged. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but um, on the first one, I think I think the first point is um, simultaneous three-phase injection of both AC and DC tests. I think that's firstly a time-saving of testing, but also to reduce the up and downs when you're testing a transformer to do connections and reconnections. The second point is the frequency dependent 10 delta measurement that I have mentioned in my presentation. And I think the first, the third one is really OLTC diagnostics in terms of the OLTC and the dynamic resistance measurement, as well as also the vibroacoustic measurement. I think that's a very new technique where you actually listen to the, to the actual clunk from the tap changer from one tap to the next, and you're making sure that that clunk is the same over the age of the transformer. And um, that is a very new technique as well. Okay, so thanks for that. I, I see a question uh, from somebody called Alpha Savage Cousin. I'm not sure if that is his real name, but uh, from, from Alpha Savage Cousin. Uh, and, and it's an interesting one for me. That, what is the lifetime of a transformer? Is it a set life or does the life vary depending on how you treat this piece of equipment? And the question he asks is, uh, do we need to replace a transformer that may be considered end of life in time? Uh, but still working. Do we need to replace it? Okay, I, I think let's uh, throw this question uh, at Luendrin. Luendrin, uh, do you want to come in here? Okay. Um, I think if I could predict the life of a transformer, I would win the Nobel Prize immediately. <laughs> right. But uh, there's different aspects to look at it. Uh, let's. Let's look at uh, how Eskom procures their transformers, which I believe is, is very good. They do a full design review. Their specification is really good. They do audits on the factory and so forth. So what that avoids is uh, buying a transformer not for the application, right? So it will deteriorate if you buy a, a transformer that has high levels of moisture, it's not designed properly for the application. So it reminds me of a story of a donkey and a racehorse. So if you buy a donkey initially, you can never make it a racehorse, right? No way, it doesn't have the genetic structure. So there's a lot of factors. It's also an important concept called uh, condition versus time model, which is a quite a simple model. And it, what's important is to, at the point at which the transformer starts to develop a fault and the time it takes to catch that fault, so to speak. That's the important thing. And you can uh, increase the lifespan as such. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, look, the next question here from uh, Anati uh, Mogani. I hope I've got that pronounced right. Uh, and, and I'm going to throw this one at Marco. Uh, and the question is, does partial discharge measurement on bushing mean, con I mean I'm talking about online partial dis 
charge measurement on bushings mean continuous real-time microsecond real-time measurement down to the microsecond level or does it mean taking samples at predetermined uh, times uh, can you give us an answer on that marco yeah, yeah that's a very very important question so definitely it has to be continuous uh, for uh, detecting uh, like internal arcing like in the example that we have seen today it has to be continuous if you do two three four measurements per day you're going to miss uh, important things like uh, loose of connections electric shields and stuff like that definitely very important so microseconds milliseconds continuous the important thing is that it is continuous yes thank you i see a question here from Sai gora an old uh, friend and colleague of mine uh, who used to be in the municipal sector and now in 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 the private sector i understand and, and it gets back to this dga analysis um uh, where we've had a question on this before, but uh, let's have another one. And I'm going to throw this at Luke, if I may. Uh, uh, Sai, she asks the following. Uh, most of the suggested actions uh, were to do with a DGA analysis. So wouldn't uh, DGA online monitoring be more beneficial? Uh, and we've heard yeah. some response from Sidwell on, on this matter, but I, I, I'm interested to get your view. Uh, is, is this a local problem that we've experienced or is this a bigger problem? No, no, I appreciate the question. It is, is a good question. The context of the question was on bushing monitoring and in Marco's presentation, he showed that when partial discharge monitoring was performed on a bushing to predict a failure, the subsequent DGA from the bushing confirmed the problem. So here's, the, why, here's why you can't do it in reverse. The, the oil in the bushing is in its own self-contained uh, enclosure. It is not mixed with the uh, main tank and there is no easy access to that oil in the bushing. So it is true that the bushing oil holds good and interesting diagnostic information, but it is also true that it is, it is not possible to get access to it when the transformer is online and live. So that's the reason why uh, it's not done. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Thank you very much for that, uh, Luke. A question I, uh, from Tom Dalton here. Uh, and and a touch, I'm going to throw this at you again, Luke, because uh, uh, he, he was talking, he's talking about a partial discharge measurement uh, and it's, uh, it needs specialist uh, you know, equipment and people um only if, if if there's a suspected problem but his question boils down to would ultrasound detect these conditions like bushing partial discharges or other partial discharges in the transform you've alluded to these wireless magnetically yeah. attached monitoring devices so can you just expand a little sure. bit about this uh, acoustic measurement of partial discharge certainly with pleasure so the word acoustic may have you think uh, something we can hear it's not, it's not in the audible band. So acoustic emission refers to something way out of the audible band in the ultrasonic range. Mm -hmm. And these absolutely minute acoustic emission signals uh, vibrate the tank or vibrate the, the bushing and you can detect them with very sensitive, typically piezoelectric transducers on the outside of the transformer. So Tom, to your point, the measurements are way up in the higher frequency, 60 to 150 kilohertz. And because they're outside the audible band, we're able to apply a lot of gain to the back end of those sensors because we're not overwhelmed by the audible noise. And we're able to pull those minute signals out of the background and make some sense of them. Thank you very much. Another question from Prince Moyo here. I don't know if it's a question or more of a comment. Uh, and I'm uh, I'm not going to throw this at you, Sidwell, because you're kind of too close to Prince Moyo. Uh, <laughs> so let's see what somebody else says <laughs> on, on this subject. Uh, uh, but Prince Moyo says inspection and monitoring is both manual, that means time-based, as well as online. Intervention is based on results. We do not intervene at Eskom with maintenance based just on time. For example, we will not just dry out a transformer based on time, but based on moisture results. And as Sidwell has said, we do not replace on age. Okay, that's a really interesting comment, and I don't think it's really a question, so I'm not going to pose that. But I think it, 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 it clarifies Eskom's uh, thinking 
on that, that it's not simply a time-based thing, and they don't just replace transformers based on age, on time. Uh, there are other, other considerations. So thanks for that input, Prince. Um, yeah. Oh, and I think that was an answer to a question by my, by Nati Mogani, who asked the question, do transformer fleets follow normal operation maintenance schedules, or do they have intelligent IEDs to report on maintenance required as part of risk management? I think Prince's answer is to that very question. Uh, so thank, I'm not going to go further than this. Uh, yeah, now this is an interesting one. Lung Lugile Mashele. Uh, Lungele Michele says, and I'm going to throw this at you, uh, uh, Luendron, if I may. Uh, he says, what would you say is the biggest cause of transfader in municipalities, uh, in, in municipal? Uh, is it the impact of load shedding? Is it the lack of maintenance? Is it vandalism or is it overloading, as we've seen with electricity theft, illegal connections onto distribution pole mounted transformers? So in the municipal sector, or what are the different failure modes and what's the big one? Okay, uh, so this is really a tough question. Uh, well, it's all the things you mentioned, Chris, <laughs> really part of it, right? But uh, I think uh, there's a category of failures here we have to watch. So the failures that we see, for example, is on the older units, the older transformers, not uh, primarily due to neglect, but uh, we were talking a lot here about uh, clamping structures on transformers. Now, uh, the IEC document did not uh, um, have short circuit measurements. Uh, I'm not sure about the date. So all the transformers generally in the 80s suffer from, uh, from not being able to withstand the electromagnetic forces and they, and they tend to have winding deformation, right? Which then eventually leads to a shorter term. Right, so uh, that in itself is not the municipality problem. The other problem is the lack of the diagnos uh, diagnostic skill. So you can do all the tests you do and you don't get to the right solution. Uh, for example, I use this example in my presentation. If you want to look for a, um, a dielectric fault and you do SFRA, you're not gonna see anything. Right. So I believe a lot of the um, the failures in a transformer is the result of misdiagnosis. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so uh, I, I'm moving quickly now because we're going to come to an end. Barry Bredenkamp of Sanedi, uh, which is the South African National Electricity Distribution Research Institute. I think it's uh, I'm not sure exactly the name, but Sanedi, it's an it's a agency of the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, uh, asked the question. And I'm going to throw this at you, Sid Will. Does Eskim take into account the efficiency of a distribution transformer when procuring distribution transformers? Is efficiency, I think a quick answer to this would be interesting. Yes, that's a quick answer. Yes, we do. We do what is called total cost of ownership. So that's where you consider the losses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, a question here from Sia Bonga Mukazi. Very simple question, which I can answer. Good day. Will the presentations be shared? Yes, they will. I promise you. In the next day or two, you'll get an email with all the presentations and a video recording of this webinar. And I think this is the last one, uh, and I'm going to throw this at you, uh, Luke. Uh, will the phenomena geomagnetic influence, GMI and geo and, th and solar storms be covered and considered in this webinar? <laughs> well, we're going to cover it now. Okay, so fine. Yeah. Over to you. All right. So, uh, Geomagnetically induced currents and, and solar storms are important, even for Southern Africa, even though uh, you're relatively close to the equator, there are uh, potential influences on transformers. I'll, be, I'll give a 15 second summary because I know we're pressed on time. You can induce from solar storms DC currents into the grid, which then create uh, challenges for the grid, including challenges for the transformer. The importance of monitoring is so that you can in real time visualize and appreciate and then respond to what's happening on the grid during a solar storm. Of course, there are predictions that say this is what is likely to happen, but the importance of monitoring is that you can then see in real time what to do, how to uh, respond from, a, from an operational perspective. And then of course, finally, if you were to have a, a problem it provides valuable diagnostic information in your forensics. Was this a problem perhaps caused 
by the GMA directly induced currents. Thank you uh, very much, presenters and panelists. It's been absolutely great to have you. I've learned a lot. I've enjoyed it. It's even been, for me, entertaining. And, and uh, uh, I mean, I, I've just so enjoyed it. Uh, and, and I hope uh, it's been as interesting for the listeners as it has been uh, for me. So just in conclusion, a quick summary here of what we've seen today. Uh, Sidwell uh, Matwetwa from Eskom, a very senior a corporate specialist in transformers and reactors. Uh, with uh, who participates on transformers all over the world, including South Africa, and, and shares knowledge and uh, and is close to uh, you know international organisations, including EPRI and C Gray and IEEE and others, gave a very interesting setting of the scene with specific reference to Southern Africa, South Africa, Eskom and municipal distributors who have a huge installed capacity, something like 300,000 MVA of transformers in South Africa. And it's probably a similar kind of order of magnitude in the distribution sector. Uh, and, and, it, and it kind of set the scene for how the failures are impacting on us. And that led the way into some of the solutions. Uh, Marco Tozo, Dr. Marco Tozo from Cameron Energy, uh, you know, a, a company heavily involved in, uh, in all kinds of transformer as well as switchgear and other uh, online monitoring uh, 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 techniques. Uh, spoke a lot about uh, monitoring of partial discharges in high voltage bushings and the challenging challenges of implementing this as a mainstream technique. And he gave some really interesting case studies showing the benefits of combining online measurement of capacitance, tan delta and partial discharge. Really state of the art and great to have a world leader uh, in this field talking to us today. Um, uh, Alexander Dirks, uh, oh, before that, uh, Luendran uh, Moodley spoke. Uh, Lowendron is uh, from Doble in uh, Engineering Africa, and Doble is a is a world leader in uh, this whole uh, question of condition monitoring and data analysis, and coming up with uh, condition assessments, uh, not only of an individual transformer but of whole fleets of transformers, taking into account the transformer manufacturer, the year of manufacturer, the technology, size of the transformer, etc. And, and how that, you know, this data needs to be properly uh, managed and interpreted uh, in order to come up with these uh, diagnoses and uh, uh, basically a kind of a condition metric for, for, for a transformer that is uh, uh, understandable and implementable. Um, Alexander took us through the range of uh, tests. Uh, and Alexander is uh, representing a company called Omicron, uh, who are really a world leader in uh, test equipment, uh, especially this offline tests. Uh, and, and I think Marco explained how, you know, the, the relationship between online tests and offline tests. And the online tests don't mean to say you don't have to have offline tests. In fact, it's a, it's a first step towards the, the offline tests. And, and Omicron and, and Alex uh, have a a suite of tools in their toolbox, uh, you know, to do these tests um, and to come up with easily understandable uh, guidelines for what is what is acceptable and when you're out of limits. Uh, and and uh, so uh, it was for me very valuable to hear about the offline testing uh, that uh, Alex focused on. And lastly, uh, Luke Panazel from EPRI gave us a, a picture of the global research work uh, or shall we say, the, the research work that has been done by EPRI, really state-of-the-art, leading-edge stuff, uh, and how it is then shared uh, with uh, utilities, not only in the US, but around the world, including South Africa, where EPRI is active and where ESCOM is a member. And the value of this kind of research and development work, uh, you know, in understanding this problem. It is a big issue. These are massive fleets of transformers. And uh, coming to grips with these and, and putting in place uh, solutions, not just at the individual level, but at the whole fleet level, can make the difference. Uh, so there are solutions out there. There's R&D work being done. Uh, and, and, and people at, at Eskom, uh, you know, are, are, are at the cold face, you might say, of these issues and municipalities as well. So it's been great to be able to address some of these. We've had a whole series of what I thought was really interesting questions. I think we've been able to get through most of them. I'm sorry about the time overruns, uh, but that's just unfortunate. Uh, I just couldn't stop some of the speakers. They are so passionate and enthusiastic, 
on the on their subject and it of such deep interest that it was not uh, for me uh, to try and put the brakes uh, on such presentations from global experts our next uh, webinar is going to be coming up on the 4th of uh, may and it's about an interesting topic called agrivoltaics it is the combination of solar pv and intensive agriculture underneath the solar pv panels that address the water energy food jobs nexus uh, it, it's new to south africa it's not new uh, you know in china in uh, Europe, uh, in Germany, uh, and in the US, uh, it's been done. But in South Africa, it's really new, and I think it's really important uh, to address these this combination of of, of things: uh, water, food, uh, energy, and jobs can all be addressed uh, by this uh, emerging uh, technology and practice. So that's the next one. After that, we're going to have a webinar on distribution system maintenance. Very topical, very important, very interesting because uh, the distribution, the problems with maintenance and refurbishment of assets in the distribution network is legendary. And in fact, most of our outages are caused by problems on the distribution networks uh, and not necessarily on the problems of, of, of shortage of generation capacity. Obviously, generation capacity adds to this, but when you look at the hours lost uh, to for power outages and the impact of those hours lost, I think the distribution networks is a bigger issue. Uh, uh, not to say that generation is unimportant, it is also an important issue, but that's what's coming and there's going to be more, so please keep your eye open. You're on our database now that you've joined uh, the, this webinar uh, and uh, you will receive invitations from us for future webinars. I'm looking forward to seeing you there and I just want to thank again most sincerely our presenters today for the tremendous efforts that they put in uh, and to these far-sighted organizations that have supported and sponsored this event that is Agora Energy Vendor, uh, Vendor, uh, Agora Energy Vendor which is a research uh, body uh, government think tank in Germany, ESKIM, uh, our national electricity utility, EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, a, 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 a US and global based uh, body, uh, Electrix, uh, the representative uh, for Omicron test equipment in South Africa, Alex plays a huge role in the South African uh, test and measurement uh, sector, Doble, a world leader with a very uh, deep indigenous activity in South Africa and Africa, Cameron M Energy also having uh, uh, representatives in South Africa and bringing to us world leaders uh, such as Marco today. These are far-sighted companies, the world leaders in this field, the world leaders. So uh, I hope you're going to be able to connect with them uh, uh, because they have a lot of knowledge to share. Thank you everybody for attending. It's been a great pleasure and an honor for me to host this webinar and uh, I will hopefully see you at the next one. All the best.